sorry for for delay um, for four minutes wow um, good morning everyone and welcome to the faculty of uh, communication and science uh, time to confession time for confession i'm not Ana isabel rodriguez vasquez our dean yes uh, that's obvious but uh, she won't be able to join us uh, today and uh, so she she asked to me uh, to make a welcoming uh, speech. Uh, please uh, imagine, uh, I beg you, uh, my words in her mouth uh, or, or vice versa. Um, there are speakers, uh, there are speakers, professors, and doctoral masters and bachelor's degree students. Welcome to the Universidad de Santiago de Compostela, to the Faculty of Communication and Science, and to this international symposium coordinated by a group of students of uh, Thanks to Brainstorm Multimedia, Open University of, Nieder of, the, of the Netherlands, a White Loop Company, uh, Servimap, and uh, to all online uh, and face-to-face -face participants in this international meeting about uh, virtual communication for teaching innovation. In 1962, at a dinner in honor of the Nobel Prize winners, John Fitzgerald Kennedy shared with them uh, the following words, literally. I think this is the most extraordinary collection of talent, of human knowledge, that has ever been gathered together at the White House, with the possible exception of when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. Someone once said that Thomas Jefferson was a gentleman of 32, uh, who could uh, calculate an eclipse, survey an estate, tea an artery, plan an edifice, tree a cows, break a horse, and dance the minuet. End of quote. I remember uh, today that famous Kennedy speech because rarely do we have this opportunity to open the doors of our uh, house of knowledge to such a relevant and necessary group. Relevant because uh, they are all researchers with a great international impact. Thank you. And uh, necessary because not so, not so long ago we learned in the worst possible way the importance of having a strong and accessible virtual communication. Do you remember uh, mid-March 2020? A tiny particle of just uh, 0 0.5 micrometers, named coronavirus, locked the planet and made us vulnerable. That was the indisputable fact. Fortunately, in a very short time, we have gone from being vulnerable to resilient, thanks, thanks to communication. If I may say so, virtual communication was the other relevant vaccine against the virus. No, that's true. Nothing, nothing was the same. Exception became the only rule, and we lost loved ones, common space, and smiles, and fundamental freedoms. But we continue to talk, to work together, and of course to continue, uh, we continue, sorry, to learn together. The Universidad de, uh, de Santiago de Compostela response was swift. swift. Barely 48 hours after the global lockdown, our faculty started broadcasting in its, its first, first virtual classes. Thousands of students were moved from the classroom to the screen in a mosaic of unforgettable faces and anecdotes. Yes, it's true. It was difficult for us, but um, for others, for, for others was, it was impos impossible. I am thinking uh, of all the people, always too many, without the necessary tools and, and, techno and technology to enable virtual communication. Together with other research efforts, 
the European project Cloud Class takes on the maybe biggest challenge of humanity since World War II, ensuring human connection. I would like to end my speech with a plea to all speakers, uh, to all online and face-to-face -face participants in this international symposium. Please keep walking, keep working, keep researching, keep innovating, keep world, keep world people together in any critical situation. This is the only way to ensure uh, that no one, no one will be left behind. This is the only way to keep alive the lesson learned not so long ago with the brave Galician people after the worst ecological catastrophe in their history. When that oil tanker, do you, do you remember, the Prestige, painted the Galician coast in black, dirty black. Please remember and keep alive that cry for survival. Nunca mais, never again. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Lois, it's your turn to present, and uh, we win time. Come on. Well, hello, good morning, and welcome you all here. It's a pleasure to have you all here and in this international symposium. It's a pleasure to introduce you uh, the symposium, teach learners, to, teach learners Through the Looking Glass, a virtual communication as an educational experience. I'm sure it's going to be very interesting. And it's a pleasure to introduce you uh, Professor Roy Mendez, he holds a PhD in research in information technologies from this university, Santiago de Compostela, and he is a beloved assistant professor here at this institution. He received a first degree in computer systems from the University of Santiago de Compostela, and he is a master in computing from the Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya. He is also a researcher here of the Group of Estudos Audiovisuais, and he is now focusing his research on virtual TV sets virtual and augmented reality, human-computer interaction, and new technologies in communication. So he's a very interesting man. Uh, he has been collaborating with Rainstorm for more than 10 years during the development of his PhD and postdoc research. And it is also a pleasure to welcome Rocío del Pilar Sosa Fernández. Uh, she's an audiovisual communicator from the University of Federico Villarreal in Peru. And she studied a master's degree in journalism and new trends in information at the University of Santiago de Compostela. She's currently working on her doctoral thesis within the PhD program in contemporary communication and information at this very faculty. And her thesis is about the educational potential of virtual and augmented reality in higher education. I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting talk. And also we invite the, the audience to get involved and, and participate and, and learn, as Professor Castello uh, said before, learn and work. So, uh, welcome you all and enjoy. Thank you. OK, thank you, Lois, for your kind words. words. Uh, and thank you all for coming here to this international symposium. As a coordinator, I must thank your presence, even the people who is here in the faculty or those that are watching us online. Uh, this first presentation, or this first part of the presentation, tends to show you the main program we are working with, which is Edison, is the main program uh, behind Cloud Class. So my goal in this, in this presentation is just to be here. I'm live from the TV set that we have here in the Facultad de, de Comunicación Audiovisual. Uh, so I'm going to explain through this presentation uh, the different um, steps we are taking in Cloud Class. I'm going to explain a little bit about the, the technology. First of all, I'm going to explain our relationship with Brainstorm Multimedia, which is the, the company who develops uh, the software. Then I'm going to explain briefly what a traditional virtual TV set is and what Edison comes to change. 
And then finally, I'm going to present what the role in cloud class of the Universidad de Santiago de Compostela is. Uh, and then after, Rocio will uh, get in a deeper view of what she's doing in her PhD thesis, which is very related to this, to this project. So first of all, as Lois said, um, Brainstorm and the University of Santiago de Compostela, or the Grupo de Estudios Audiovisuales, which is the one we are researchers in, uh, is a, a relationship that has been carried since the last uh, almost uh, 13, 14 years, since this uh, virtual set where I am now has been uh, built since 2009. That was where this uh, TV set was, was built. Then. Uh, the collaboration has uh, done or has uh, taken us to several different approaches. For example, in training, there has been two training stages of international uh, professionals of the television that have come to this faculty to learn how to use uh, Brainstorm software. And also the teachers also were participating on those trainings. Uh, also in teaching, for example, Edison and the brainstorm environment has been used in Innovation Lab, which is a subject that in audiovisual communication in the fourth year uh, of the degree, the main goal of this subject uh, is for the students to learn how in the practical part, to learn how a virtual TV set works and to create content using virtual TV sets. Now we are using Edison, which is this environment I'm, I'm now. Uh, it's also used or uh, related with PhDs, with my own PhD, in which we developed two uh, software registrations that work with a, a brainstorm uh, environment. And uh, we studied how to include uh, new sensors in a virtual environment so that the presenter could have interactivity with the virtual surrounding. And finally, and Rocio's PhD, of course, Rocio is assisting me here uh, today, uh, um, is also related with uh, this environment that is Edison where I am uh, now. And finally, of course, there's uh, been a lot of collaboration in research as this project uh, is an example, Cloud Class, but we have had other projects in the past and we are working on having future projects together. So it's a very, uh, long-term relationship. So, uh, what's a virtual TV set? A virtual TV set is a space where you can uh, com uh, combine in real time a real image from the cameras. Uh, I am the real image from the cameras. I have a camera here which is recording me. And uh, also uh, CGI virtual elements, elements that are rendered by a computer and it's the surrounding. The main thing with this surrounding is that it is a, a 3D model. It's a 3D object. It's not a plain uh, image, a 2D image. It's a 3D environment. As in a 3D environment, there are objects that are behind me as a real person. And there are objects that can be in front of me. To achieve this combination, if we go to the next slide, Rothi, please. If we, to achieve this combination, uh, we need two main things in a traditional virtual TV set. One is camera alignment. This is, uh, the meaning of this is that uh, to have a coherent final image, the point of view of the real camera, which is recording me in this case, uh, must be uh, the same as the virtual camera. Uh, that is re rendering the 3D uh, space, like recording the 3D space, uh, just to say it like that. So uh, for that, uh, sensors are needed to know the position and orientation of the cameras and to be able to move the cameras. These sensors are pretty expensive, as, as you could imagine. And then there's the chroma keying, that is the technique that, that you probably know. Uh, I'm here in the virtual set, which we have a green surrounding around if we activate it. OK, you can see the real image that is being captured by the camera. I'm here in this uh, green environment. So if we deactivate it, now uh, I, we are doing the chroma keying, and I'm again inside the, the virtual environment because all the green parts have been erased. This is an image of the original virtual TV set that was built here in 2010. Uh, you can see there the sensors which were mechanical and all the complexity of the system. I, I, I like to announce that we are 
finally updating this this environment this year. Uh, hopefully, in December we will have a new whole new equipment with new cameras and all the technical stuff will be renewed. Just for you to see how this environment is and how complex it is. So, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, we have four main characteristics that we can have for of a virtual TV set. The first one is the 3D environment, as I told you before. We have a uh, 3D surrounding objects that are uh, around me in this case. Then uh, we have <clears throat> physics. Uh, what do I mean with physics? You, uh, when you are in a virtual environment, you are not, uh, you don't need to follow the law of physics. For example, things can fly, things can appear and disappear, can become transparent, can change their color, their size. It, there are no limits to imagination of what you can do in a virtual environment. And this is very important, live production. Live production is something you have to take into account. I'm talking live to you uh, and uh, virtual TV sets. And uh, even though you can record, of course, we can record what I'm doing now, but they are thought to uh, live recording, to live uh, broadcast, to do everything live. Uh, so that's a problem with all the 3D elements as rendering is a very complex process that takes time and, and consumes resources of the, of the machines. So you, have a, a, you need a usually very powerful machines to, to run this, this software. And finally, I talk, I talk about savings, uh, and this is a two-way two um, uh, option because uh, you have savings as you have a green screen and you just change a, a simple a simple 3D object and you get a new environment and new objects all around. But as I said before, this technology, as it's meant in the traditional way with the sensors and everything, it's a very, very expensive technology, so it's not for everyone. And of course, we are talking about bringing this technology to schools or to universities, and universities don't have that amount of money, uh, usually, to, to construct a, a, a traditional virtual TV set. So to solve this in this project, uh, we uh, brainstorm uh, uh, proposed Cloud Class, uh, which is based in, in the software Edison. It's bringing Edison to the cloud, but uh, Francisco Ibanez probably will explain it uh, better uh, 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 later this morning. Uh, but for you to understand more or less what Edison is about, uh, here I'm speaking just uh, in the virtual set, which is this green surrounding I have around, but it could be just a plotter that I have Behind me, uh, we don't need this big surrounding uh, space, or it could be a cloth that I put in, in my wall or wherever. Uh, we are using a camera, which is a Sony ZV-1. Uh, please, Rocio. Yes, uh, a Sony ZV-1, which is a small and cheap camera uh, that is like uh, not the expense of a broadcast uh, camera. And we are using this uh, microphone, which is a Rode Wireless Go. With these three elements and the Edison software, we are just on to work and we are doing this uh, transmission through Teams. So you can imagine the potential of this, uh, of this software to bring uh, uh, virtual TV sets to the consumer or to the teachers in this case, or the students also. So in, in Edison, what we have is an environment, uh, which is the, what we call the background, is this surrounding space we have around. And uh, this background can be changed. Uh, and we have not the, the three layers I told you before, the background, the real image, and the elements in front. But the presenter is a square, as you see here. I'm just being projected to this square. And when we activate the chroma keying, the square disappears, and then I'm integrated in the, in the environment. If we move the virtual camera, you see that the square follows me. We are showing you the trick we use. The square follows me, and it seems that I am moving, following the camera, but I'm not moving because the camera is, is, is in the same position, the real camera. I'm just looking at the same camera all the time. The thing is with this uh, system, we can simulate uh, infinite cameras without the need of having to have these uh, sensors to know the position of the camera. We like trick this and fake uh, 
in, in some point uh, the the uh, the position of the real camera just with this movement of the of the square you saw before. Um, of course, you have seen that we can move the camera freely all along the, the, the environment. We can also change the, the surroundings. And for example, we can have a real video. I'm here in, in the Louvre. Uh, so we only need to have a video which has tracking. That's that the video records also the image, but also the information of the camera movement. And then you can integrate the presenter. You see that the camera is moving, and I'm moving coherently with the camera. So we can use both a background, which is a, a, a video, or a 3D environment. Moreover, we have the background, we have the presenter, or the real world what, that we are uh, recording. But as I am just a square inside all this, no, can we come back, Rothil, please? Uh, uh, as I'm just a square here, I can be repeated several times. It does, doesn't make sense, but now we are going to see a gigantic Roy here, <laughs> okay? I'm double here, we are two squares. It, this doesn't make sense, but we can get, for example, a person uh, from Australia that connects to our system, and I can be talking in this virtual environment with this other person. We can uh, put together six different people from these six different locations. So we could share the same virtual space at the same time, six different people in Edison. Okay, now we can go to the next. Thank you. So we have uh, slides like this, uh, where we have a, a normal PDF or a PowerPoint uh, and we can have other different uh, models, like this graphics bar that appeared earlier, but this is the proper camera position to see it well. You see, it's a graphic that we can change the values and the, the, the lettering that appears in it without any problem. It's an Aston, which is part of the brainstorm environment, an Aston element, so we can introduce graphics bars or we can introduce different elements, like, for example, a video. If we go to the next slide, where you can see this is just a video, a normal and common video, and we can put it in full screen as it is now, and I'm in the video. This video has no tracking, of course. And we can also put the video as a presentation. You see not here, it's a 3D object that is just present here in the, in the, in the environment. We can also load uh, 3D elements, uh, which we are going to see now, one of them. For example, we can see this uh, Milos uh, Venus object, which is an object, a free object that has been downloaded from the internet. So you can see that we can introduce in the presentation 3D elements without a problem. We could move it and rotate it and interact with it. And we, for example, we have another example of, of a 3D object, which is this one here. Okay, I don't know why it's rotating like that. It's a show problem. <laughs> it always, when you show some technology, there are problems. That doesn't matter, Rafael. It's, it's okay. We can go to the next slide. And we can load, as you see, different uh, 3D objects and different elements without any problem. And we can get them from the internet or have someone who who develops them or, or buy them because they are for, for selling, as you see, that they can be introduced without any problem inside the, the, the Edison environment. Now, Rocio is going up to continue after my speech, and I will finish my presentation uh, with this just uh, last slide. I, I, I want to tell also that I'm here, I'm with all my, my body present, but it could be that I am uh, behind the table, for example, and my legs won't be visible. And for that, uh, there's also a solution, which is a stand, a virtual stand that appears uh, here in the, in, the, in the software. And finally, uh, um, our goal or the role of uh, OSC uh, in, the, in Cloud Cloud, the University of Santiago de Compostela, uh, is uh, mainly three points, so we can add uh, uh, dissemination uh, with this symposium or the book that is going to be presented later. Uh, but uh, as main research goals, let's say, we have three scenarios. The first one is the uh, use of this technology 
in different use cases. Uh, we're going to see an example uh, in, uh, today with Antia Mosquera's presentation, which is a student who came to us. She knew we had uh, this technology and she wanted to create some content. So she came to us to create that content and we just did it. Uh, Rocío worked with her to, to create uh, her presentation. Uh, we also are testing it as a tool for students. As I said before, in Innovation Lab, what we have is a a uh, final project in which the students have to use the technology to create content, to create a presentation. So we are testing if it's a valid software for the students to use to create their own presentations, uh, online presentations, videos, uh, small pills of information. And we are finally uh, testing it with uh, teachers as a tool for teaching. Uh, the, the Open University of the Netherlands will, will present later the view of a distance learning environment, but here we have a traditional teaching, but we're uh, exploring how this tool can be used in traditional teaching in the Universidad of Santiago de Compostela. We, are, uh, we have uh, uh, developed the methodology to, to do the, the, the research, and uh, we are now starting to apply it. We have already done it with a teacher from history, and that's what Rocío is going to present now, because uh, she is the one who developed the methodology and the one who is uh, doing the interviews and all the process, so she is the uh, one who can explain it uh, better. I don't know if she already arrived there, but if not, I can answer some questions or whatever to, for you to see that I am really in live broadcasting. Okay, so uh, I let you now with Rocio, and I'm going to go up and then I will answer your questions where Rocio finishes with, along with her. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Um, just helped uh, Roy, as you know, we have a lot of technical problems. Sorry for that, but it's all about the technology. Now I present the methodology design of my thesis. One is about the test Edison cloud class. It's the same technology, but Roy, as Roy explained, it's different because it's an online version of Edison in the case of cloud class. Now, in the follow-up presentation has the same structure. First, I propose how we test Edison or Cloud Class and what is the approach of this investigation. Then, I explain the methodological design of this research and what is the process, what's the way we did, what the steps we take in this investigation. Finally, I present the first result. It's an example of one finished case because we are always working with both two more cases. So first of all, I want to explain what is the purpose of this investigation. We try to know or to find out how is the use of Caucas in, this, in, in, the, in the way of teaching, how, they, how it improves the way we teach in three main perspectives. One is about teachers, how they use it, how they adapt the teaching content for introduce the introduce cloud class in their subject. And the last one is about the perspective of students. So the main purpose of this research is to focus on three main points. This, teachers, teaching content, and students. Then what was the approach of this research? One is an educational approach because it's a technology that's, that is introduced in higher education in the way they, they create some material for the use of students. And then it's a perspective of communicative point of view because as you see in the previous, uh, as you saw in the previous presentation, Cloud Class was a technology about using a virtual television set who has audiovisual language, who, who use, for example, shots, uh, move of cameras. So we want to find out what is the point of educational and communicative point of view. Now I present the methodological design. In this case, we choose the methodology of case studies with three main points. One is we want to define or to compare different profiles of teachers. One is about exact science, the other is humanities, and then the education. Why we choose these three profiles? 
because maybe it's different a teacher who teach maths than a teacher that, for example, teach history or have a lot of experience, lex experience, or have a lot of skills and technology use in every, day, in every day. So we want to compare different profiles of teachers and find out what is the similarities, the difference, and how they adapt the, the material to use for different students also. It's not similar students in maths, in history, and literature, and I don't know. Maybe it's a lot of difference about that. Then we have the select criteria of this research. First of all, the teaching experience. Why is important teaching experience? Because it's different than a teacher who has a lot of experience, less experience in teaching. Another is about expository teaching. All the cases, all the teachers have expository teach, teaching. Why? Because they, um, as previous studies show, there is a lot of potential of using immersive technologies for to be more dynamic in class. So we want to introduce Edison in a specific expositor, expository teaching. Then the affinity with technology. Maybe a younger teacher has more skills in using technology than older teachers who has a lot of experience. So we want to compare three profiles of teachers and find out what is the difference and similarities about them. We choose also the triangulation of three main techniques. One is in deep interviews, the other is a direct observation, and a focus group. But we not only focus in three techniques, also use other techniques that I explain later. What is the process of this investigation? First of all, we contact teachers. It's difficult to find some, some it's difficult that teachers participate in this kind of investigation. Why? Because they have a lot of things to do in university, like this symposium, for example. They have course, they have teaching less. They have a lot of things to do. So it's difficult to find teachers who can really participate in this investigation. First of all, I, we create, for example, a manual of good practice. What is about a manual of good practice? This is a I can share this document to them to show some, to, to give them some information about the audiovisual language. The sh for example, what is a shot, what, ta what types of shots they are, and also, for example, how we create an storyboard, how to, make, to, to create an audiovisual material from the first step as an idea, for example, how to materialize the concept. So we give them these brief, brief documents with very, very simple concepts about audiovisual language. Maybe they will use this manual for creating some audiovisual material later. So after we give them or share the manual of book practice, we, did, we do the first interview. In this first interview, uh, also, there is three interviews during, during the process. One is the first, to get, um, to get some idea what is the profile of teachers, what is the profile of students, what is about the subject they teach. And then is the last one interview that I explain later. And in the middle of the process, there's, there is a brief interview because we also do another techniques. And this, in this first interview, we try to ask teachers how they teach what is the skills that they have in technology, for example, if they use technology in their normal lives, if they, for example, teach some kind of innovation, they modify the content that they teach in classes, how is the perception of students? They, they are participating in class, they are very communicative, I don't know. Maybe we want to find out what is the general idea of this, this profile of teacher, the content, and also the students. We only, we only have to consider the three main points that we exp I explained before. After we finish the first interview, we do the analysis of teaching material. We ask them to share with us some material that they normally use in their teaching, but after we compare what is the normally use and what is the use of Edison in the same subject, for example. In the next part of this process, we have the teacher training. We have, in this part, we also, 
work with both researchers. Why? Because one is an instructor and give um, the teacher training, how they use a cloud class, for example, how they move in the environment. And we decided that one is an instructor, a specific teacher, and other is the observer. This teacher training has two lessons. One is a theoretical lesson about, for example, how we use Edison, and the other is the practical use. Then, then we, they create some mini project to just to test the technology. After we finish the teaching lesson, the, the teacher training, we also have the video recording. In this part, we use, for example, two techniques is the brief interview to ask how was the teacher training for them, it was easy to follow the instruction, if they move, if they feel comfortable in the virtual environment. So, and another is the direct observation. We, for example, recording the video in the virtual set that you saw before, so we can have two cameras and one microphone, and it's a space near to the virtual set that I can watch the teachers creating some material. So I can, for example, observe if they are comfortable in the environment, if they ask questions to the instructor, for example, if they are share some ideas, for example, and participate, how they materialize concepts, I don't know. There is a lot of items for, for try to test in this direct observation. After we finish the video recording, we ask them to complete, in their own words, the teacher's diary. In this part, we ask them how they feel during the process. What was the impression, the perspectives? I don't know. And also, we analyze of the material creating. When we're recording a video in cloud class, it's not necessarily the post-production. So after we rec finish recording the video, we give them there is a material that they can use in their lessons. So we analyze the material about what elements they include, for example. What, um, if they change a lot of uh, backgrounds, if they, for example, include more than one actor, it's, um, I think that this is our perspective, point of view of the video. And then, for example, we ask them to complete a checklist of the manual. In this checklist is only 10 questions, very brief questions about, do you include 3D elements, for example? Do you include some image? Do you include some videos? Why do you choose this uh, environment? So it's a brief, brief, um, brief checklist and to compare what they think they include and what we think they include. We compare these two informations. And also we do the final interview. In this final interview, we ask them um, what was the experience? It was the same as they think in the first moment? Or is completely different? Was a very enjoyable experience for them? And, that's, and we try to find out it was a good experience. They enjoyed the process. How is the perspective of the students also? What they, if the students like, maybe they don't like the, the material, it's boring for them, I don't know. So after we finish with teachers in this part, we continue with the students. In this part, we ask them to complete a questionnaire. This is a brief questionnaire with 15 questions about, for example, if they watch the entire video, the duration of the video was okay for them, if they post a video, they reload the video, if they take notes, in which part they take notes, what elements they like most, for example. After we finish the questionnaire, we continue with a focus group of students. We ask, why do you like this element, for example? Do you enjoy the video? What notes they, they take, for example, when they watch the video? So we have two techniques in this part. One is the questionnaire, and the other is the focus group. We compare this, these two techniques to complete the information, try to find out what was the experience also for students. After this process uh, is finished, we will, we will want to create, or we would like to create a user model manual. In this manual, we want to include, for example, the best recommendation how we create, for example, a material in cloud class. 
what is the best, the best way, no? The more easy way that they maybe no, don't get frustration in the first part, no? So now I present the first result. It's only one case, um, two cases are waiting for us to continue working in this academic semester, so I hope we will finish in May, with luck, maybe. So this is the case of Anna. We choose three different profiles. One is a, mat a mathematician teacher in maths, a teacher in maths, and the other is about a history teacher, and, and the last one is a teacher who is expertise in education. She usually teach software, te technological software, so these are different profiles that, for example, the math teacher is a very younger teacher with less experience than a history teacher, for example, who has a lot of experience. And also the young teacher have more, has more skills in technology than a older teacher with have more experience. There are different profiles that we choose for this research, and what I want to present is Anna, a history teacher, who is a full professor in Asian history in this faculty at Santiago de Compostela. She has classes in philology and also in geography and history. She chose, she chose a course who is, which is called Greco-Roman History, Art and Philosophy. Why they choose this course? Because she is an expertise in the history of Rome. And also he di she did their her, her thesis about the history of Rome. And the history of Rome has 1,200 years. It's a long journey that they, want, they should learn in one academic semester. So she's an expertise. She also feels very comfortable when they speak, for example, or teach in classes because they have a lot of knowledge. And it's a, also a course that she teach, she's teaching for 12 years. So it's an expertise in this subject. She has a lot of knowledge and it's more comfortable for her to introduce this kind of technology in this subject. I, I can show, we can share this video. It's a 20, approximately 20 minutes video. Um, in the first part, for example, Anna is a professor who wants to introduce or create a presentation with few words. She doesn't like to introduce any elements that can distract the students, so she chose, for example, a very simple background. Without any element, a uh, presentation, as you can see, in, in white with few words, not a lot of things because in her experience, it's, it's very easy that the students get distracted for anything. So she, she can, she always <laughs> say to me that students can focus in what I said. No is in any element. Because if you, for example, put some elements, maybe if you ask, what do you remember about to watch in this video? Uh, I remember this element. You know, it's, it, maybe it's not important that. So she decided a very simple presentation, introduced some elements, for example, uh, this, um, this map is in white, very simple map without anything. And this is a map, for example, of where um, in this village started the history of Rome. She explained how the empire expanded in, for this part. What students like the most in this video? One is image. Because Anne, for example, have a lot of audiovisual material of this theme. The history of Rome has movies, have documentaries. She explained, for example, the history or the story of this movie and try to explain what is important for them to watch. And she's speaking, and in the background, as you can see, is the movie uh, playing. So, um, for Anne, for example, one thing that I remember is that um, in the first part of the process, she was very frustrated with the software. Why? Because she never used software, technical software, or I don't know, because she's very, I don't know, maybe she's a profile of teacher that don't normally use technology. So in the first part, to try to use Edison or Cloud Class was very difficult for her to follow the instruction. Um, it's a very complicated uh, software, what she said. But in the end of the, the process, when it's the, 
the step of recording the video, she was very, it was a very good experience for her because she stipulated that we can record maybe in one day, during the all that day, many hours, but in four hours we recorded the entire video and she enjoyed the experience. So it's um, maybe a very complicated uh, first steps, but in the end was a very great uh, experience. Um, Another element that they uh, finally she want to introduce or to include for, was the timelines. There is a lot of emperors in the history of Rome, so there is three timelines during the whole video, but in this part, for example, she explained the history uh, there is a lot of emperors, there is a, three periods of the history of Rome, and for example, in this uh, specific part of the video, the students stop the video and take notes. What's the most important emperors in the history of Rome? It's a very useful element for, uh, for teaching for example. Another element was maps. Um, this element the students liked the most was maps. Why? Because if you remember in the first, um, the first video, there is a simple map in, in a presentation, very simple, white and black, white and black uh, map. And you, as you can see, it's a, not like an interactive map because she's walking inside a map. She explained that we start in a very small village, but the, maybe um, Rome increased the empire during the 1,200 years. So for Anne, for example, for Anna, was very easy to interact with elements because she has, for example, a screen in front of her and she, she can see uh, what she's doing. So she was very easy for her to record in the video. She said to me that it's similar to teaching class, just to put uh, on a screen and continue the, the speech. So for her, for example, it was, was very easy to introduce this map. This is a map with different surfaces. She's walking. I, for example, I teach, the, teach her that we can walk only in this space, and she, she did very, very good. So for her, it was a very good experience at the end of the process, not in the first part. Maybe we can change these first, first steps to, to get a way more simple for, for teachers than to complicate process, and because in the end, it's a, it was a good experience for, for Anna. It's a very great experience, for, for example, for history teachers. I don't know in the other cases. I don't know if in mathematician, for example, for teacher in maths or as expertise in education, but Maybe it's the same, and the result was good in the end of the process. So we hope so for the next cases. Thank you very much for your attention. completely clear. <laughs> Brave student and professors, please. I do have a question. It's, uh, oh, thank you very much. Um, so it's really exciting that the journey you made together with the teachers. And um, I want to ask you how those first steps uh, looked like. So um, starting from the manual and how you came up with these um, little tips and tricks for the teachers and which of them were most useful? Um, for them, the most useful was the, um, for example, the type of shots, the move of cameras, they know that there is an idea. If you want to create some audiovisual material, you want to, for example, first of all, a brainstorm of ideas and how we can adapt the, the project. We, for example, um, we try to get in, we maybe should create some material with a lot of image and also infographic. Why? Because we, as we can see, when we want to learn something, if you put an image, it's more easy for them to, to understand the concepts. So this is an infographic, for example, if I have some idea, how we materialize this idea and make an audiovisual material. I think it's the most important part because we have in this, in this, in this infographic the 
pre-production, the production and post-production of any audiovisual material. I think it's the most impart, important part of the manual. And I have a follow-up question. I mean, um, the teachers were using it on their own? I mean, the software and they were preparing the materials on their own and then you just helped recording? Or were you also involved in the process of uh, developing those resources? Okay. Um, <laughs> we also involved in the process because we want to collaborate and create some material. Maybe we assist them with during the process, yeah? But there are their own ideas, they create the material as they want. We only assist them and to help maybe with some ideas. How we can materialize if, for example, they need some elements, we share them, we try to find out. Uh, if we, for example, Anna wants to walk in a map, no? And I try, yes, maybe we can do little surface on the maps and maybe she can walk, no? We help them, we assist, but it's their own way. The thing we, uh, we found here is that at the beginning when we talked to them, we, we said, okay, just manage wherever you want and we will see what we can do. We will help you, we will support you. And uh, maybe that was an error <laughs> because, for example, there's one case in which she was very enthusiastic, but uh, she wanted to do a very spectacular thing and it, it could be done. We found the materials in the internet to create like a law court and it was uh, maths and it was like discussing, you know, okay, he's guilty or not guilty and just playing a, a math stuff that we don't yeah. understand at all. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the things that she got frustrated with the with the technology mm -hmm. because she was very into doing herself everything. Mm -hmm. So what we are tending is we, we mm -hmm. just have one example and we are in this two working also. But what we are thinking is that for teachers, at least at the beginning, they need lots of support and they need a person there that's following all the process from the idea. The idea is from the teachers. And mm -hmm. you just, okay, we can do this. What do you think about using this? But technically, you have to have someone giving support during all the of process. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I have one question related to Kate's question. Which would you say is the profile of the person that will support the teacher in the first steps? Because, <laughs> I mean, it could be a 100% technical profile yeah. that could assist in some things, but you are talking about searching for materials, help them to create the, the content, the, uh, no? So what would the best profile, if you have to choose one? With the permission of Rocio, <laughs> she is the profile. <laughs> <laughs> what is your profile, Rocio? <laughs> because <laughs> she has both. She comes from the visual world, so she has that knowledge. And now she has been studying a lot of how to learn, how to research, uh, how the learners learn, how the teachers behave. So for me, if I had to choose someone for University of Santiago <laughs> uh, and I had money, I will put my money on Rocio immediately. Okay. So now she can answer a different thing. But <laughs> No, I think it's a professional who has a lot of knowledge in education also, and audiovisual language, and of course to use uh, Cloud Plus, for example, or Edison. Okay, thank you. She's looking someone. <laughs> She's looking someone. <laughs> Hi, so congratulations on your presentation. Um, I guess that in this moment it is just a project, but from a model business perspective, how will this work? Well, probably from the business point of view, yeah, Francisco, the the uh, which is the next presentation, presentation. or even Jim, Jim, who is talking later. Francisco is a brainstorm, and, and Jim is from White Loop, and they are going to talk about, uh, Jim is going to talk about how to bring this to reality or to education, and Francisco could answer that better. We are just a university who is supporting <laughs> in the test and the development of the product. Okay, thank you. Speaking of models, uh, you mentioned earlier that some of them will cost money to you and they're, they're not all part of Creative Commons and what, um, whatsoever. So I wanted to ask, uh, are there any plans 
for the University of Santiago <laughs> to develop a, a team dedicated for the creation of custom 3D models for, the, for all the departments of the university to use without spending any money. We hope someday <laughs> we will have that service. The, the new virtual TV set that I told you we are implementing and will be here in December, uh, it's a common service for all the universities, not just to work here or for the people who work in the virtual TV set staff like me or people from Thetius or wherever. It's for the whole university. Mm -hmm. So the main idea is that the projects that use that uh, uh, TV set uh, have enough money to keep someone, one, two persons, uh, two people, it depends in the amount of, of projects or whatever, that are experts on, on the use of the virtual TV set. So that is one profile that could uh, create uh, this 3D content. But it's a very good question, mm -hmm. because that's one of the main problems we have found during this Indeed process, course. where to find uh, objects. Uh, we have no budget. We have to find them for free. We finally find something, but maybe it's not the best solution. Uh, and uh, one thing that I didn't say, which is important also, is that uh, Edison is also works with Unreal Engine. I don't know if you know Unreal Engine. It's a, a game engine that is very, very powerful and had lots of, of models that are available. And OK, maybe uh, for every project, they, they are very, very cheap. I mean, they, it's like uh, uh, 50 euros or 100 euros, something like that, a very big model. So they are not that expensive either. So maybe it's a combination of having someone that knows how to develop them and buying some content. And maybe Brainstorm also <laughs> should uh, give some content to yeah, the people that library. uh, libraries of content. <laughs> Yes. Thank you very much, Thank you very much. for your attention and the okay. questions. Okay. Well, um, the next two lecturers are going to take cloud class from the perspective of uh, the business vision and also uh, its technical development. Um, Francisco Ibáñez who's a PhD in industrial engineering, uh, and he's a research and development director at Brainstorm Multimedia and coordinator of the Cloud Class project. Uh, on the other hand, Elena Jorka holds an international industrial PhD in sociology, and she's an assistant teacher at the University of Alicante. And there she teaches legal sociology, social innovation, and criminology. She has extensive experience in the technological sector, where she worked for many years in project coordination or as, a, as an external consultant. She also was dean of the College of Sociology of the region of Valencia. So now, please, see if you can present to us a, the Cloud Class project from television and cinema to, to education. Exactly. Uh, where's the slide? First of all, I would like to thank you, uh, the University, USC, because we are promoting uh, this project. In any project, it's very important to promote, to disseminate the results, so I think it's a, it's a very nice opportunity to, to disseminate this project. Uh, well, we are going to split the presentation in, in two parts. The first part is I'm going to explain you how we arrived to Cloud, Cloud Class, because our company is a company that is based, um, uh, the business is based on broadcast industry and film industry, and we are now in, in education, so I'm going to explain you why. And Elena is, uh, she's working uh, for the university and working also for, for Brainstorm, and she has been testing and trying the software, and she will give you the first impressions and the potential that she thinks that, that the solution has. Uh, next slide. So Brainstorm is a virtual studio technology provider, 3D graphics in general, real-time 3D graphics for television and for cinema. We work for 
uh, film industry also since 1993. So we were the first in the world wor working in, in real-time 3D graphics. And uh, the, our solution is called Infinity Set. Infinity Set is a very expensive software that is used by, by film industry and uh, for, by the, the broadcast industry also. These are some of our clients. We have clients around the world. There are more than 400 televisions that use our software. Uh, we have uh, in Spain Antena 3, uh, Spanish Television, uh, Television Española, uh, BBC, RTL, and RAI in Europe. Uh, in US, the, our software is very extended. We, we, are, we are providing all the 3D graphics in ESPN, uh, in CNBC, all the graphics of, of the stocks, market stocks are using our system, the NASDAQ. If you go to the, to the Times Square, you will see that there are uh, like a big graphics of the NASDAQ, and all these graphics are powered by our software. Next slide. So uh, there was a time that we were very focused on the large televisions. But there was also another opportunity, another business opportunity, to introduce our software in uh, more uh, smaller televisions, uh, local TVs, uh, small producers, and uh, more creative uh, industries, and uh, we applied for an European project, an European project, uh, Horizon 2020. I don't know if you know which is the framework, the research framework, but there's a lot of money in order to uh, support the creative industries. So at the end, we said, okay, we are going to uh, try to develop a project in order to uh, have uh, some money, in order to uh, some funding, in order to. Uh, try to reduce uh, the capacities of our software, make it uh, more simple, and uh, above all, reduce the price. Uh, we were talking about a software, Infinity Set, that could cost in between 40,000 40, and 60,000 euros. And for these local TVs, as small producers, we would, our target was to arrive to 15,000 euros, 10, from 10 to 15,000 euros. And, uh, also to simplify the use, because if you go to a television, uh, there's a lot of parameters that there's a lot of engineers, the lighting, the tracking system, everything needs a lot of maintenance. So it's, it's quite difficult and expensive. So we, we try to simplify everything. And we had some, some uh, local TVs that use it, and they were very happy. And uh, at least we were quite happy because uh, we extended our business, not just for large broadcasters, but also for a small television. But the next step was to say, well, in that project, in fact, there was a university, the Lapland University of, Spli of Applied Science. And they were just uh, there in order to help the, the, the small televisions to validate the system. And they told us, wow, this is uh, something that do it could, it could be used in, 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 in education. In Lapland, they are also using a lot of remote uh, learning because the, 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 there is a long distance between the university and the different remote towns that are there. And they said, OK, this, this is something that it, 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 it could be useful for, for education. We say, well, really? Say, yes. So with this amount of money, this would decrease in the, the, the price of the solution, they say, OK, we are going to create a specific use case a specific use case for education. And they uh, said, OK, this is one technology that has at least potential. So we were thinking that, OK, uh, maybe the television is, is, is now a very mature uh, sector in terms of business. And we were uh, trying to diversify our business to other sectors. And we said, OK, it seems that this solution has opportunities in in education, so let's go for that. And after democrat democratizing our technology, next slide, we try to bring this technology to education. And how we did it? The same, the European Commission, the national funds, they have funds in order to try to introduce or transfer technology for uh, top technological sector to more traditional sectors, that is education. And we, got, uh, and we got another funding, uh, a Neurostat project. It's a funding that is coming from the Commission and the, from, from, from every, every country that is participating. And in this project, we participated with uh, USC, the, University, the Open University of Netherlands, 
uh, while loop, and uh, another company, Strain, that is an Austrian company that is expert in putting uh, the, you know, the technology in the cloud. So what we, what we our, propose, uh, our proposal for this project was, okay, we have a smart set that is less expensive. We are going, it is quite affordable for, for a small organizations. We are going to adapt a smart set for education. So we are going to get all the requirements from the universities in order to adapt this technology to, to, this, to this sector. We are going to work with the educational partners in order to know and to get feedback because we don't know exactly if this, this the technology is going to be useful for the, for the educational market or not, so, or for the educational sector. We are going to prospect that. Uh, after doing that, this smart set becomes into Edison, what we call Edison. Edison is the tool that any educational organization can use for, for for virtual training or virtual education. And we are also, with the, with the Austrian company, we are also exploring the, the use of this application in the cloud. Why? Because even if we have decreased the price of this technology, uh, we need a very powerful computer. And this computer is very expensive. Roy explained it very well in his presentation. And you know now, I don't need to explain you what a virtual, a virtual set is because he has explained it very well. But the equipment is, is expensive. We, we reduce the, the lighting, the, the, the chroma key, uh, the, sorry, the chroma. Uh, we, we reduce the price of, of the components, but the computer is still expensive. So what is the possible solution for the future? Is to have this, the, 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 the powerful machine in the cloud. So any kind, any, any peop, any, anybody can access to the software without having this expensive computer. So the price will be reduced even more. So now what we are doing is uh, getting the feedback in order to improve our solution and see if it is possible to commercialize it or not in this, in this sector. So at this point, uh, the project uh, was about 30 months. Now it's one year to the end. Uh, from the technical point of view, we, we got our, our goals. That was to have, the, we, have, we have now two exploitable results. One of them is the Edison Tanky solution. That is, this Edison is completely integrated in a computer. So we, you, you don't know, or the teachers, they don't need to. Uh, to think about which kind of computer, install software, and do complicated technical things. Everything is in, in this computer. And the another, another exploitable result is the eDesk. eDesk is a table with a, with a green screen uh, that you can be seated or stand, and everything is there. The light, uh, the screen uh, where you see the result, uh, microphones, webcam, everything is there. So the, we are trying to facilitate at maximum the work, uh, the, 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 the presentation or the, the, the work that the teacher needs to do when uh, is, is preparing a class. It's just go in there, sit it in the, in the, in the desk or standing, and uh, put everything in, in, start everything in a button and uh, starting to record or to broadcast the presentation. So now. The next step is now with the help of the universities, we are validating if these solutions are uh, well adopted by, by the educational sector. And this is what, what we are doing now, and we expect that uh, the result or the feedback is positive in order to have another sector where our technology can be exploited. But we don't know. This is the uh, main goal of this project. Okay, so now my... My, my colleague Elena will, will continue. Okay, hello. <laughs> Thank you. Well, my name is Elena. I am a colleague of uh, Francisco, and also I am involved in, class, in Cloud Class uh, project. But in my case, uh, I consider myself like being part of the coordination the coordination of the project, but also uh, part of the target group of the project. Um, in bringing the technology to education, 
the Edison Technology uh, to Education, and as a complement to the task performed in the project, um, Edison is approaching higher education through an agreement with the University of Alicante, which is not a partner in the, in the Cloud Class project, but uh, is a, a facilitator for some of the experiences of the project. Uh, this is the University of uh, Alicante, and uh, we are working with the Faculty of Economics, where the Sociology Department belongs there in Alicante. So this is the Edison desk that, that Francisco just showed. This is me trying to figure out how to use it with the help of some technicians. That's why I asked Rocio, which could be the best possible profile to help not only in assisting a teacher to know how to use the audiovisual elements, but uh, helping a teacher learn how to think and to create audiovisual. Because I consider myself uh, an average teacher in the University of Alicante and probably in any uh, university in Spain at least. Uh, there is a 40% of female teachers in the University of Alicante. About 40% are between 46 and 55 years. Um, uh, more than 40% are part-time teachers. And I consider this a very important data. I will uh, let you know. And also more than 40% of teachers belongs to the legal and social uh, sciences field. So are not related with technology. Okay? So and I consider that being part-time teacher is a, a very important point in this uh, project because uh, in, the, in the user cases, in the examples that uh, Rocio said, there was a history professor. She was a full-time professor with 12 years teaching history and uh, history-related topics. But part-time teachers are the profile of teachers who work outside, uh, outside the university, and then you go to the university a few hours a week to give some classes about what you know, but you have no previous training on pedagogic, um, pedagogical uh, things or how to give classes. It's just that maybe you are a lawyer, and a few hours a week you go to the university to teach about law, and that's it. So you create the content on your intuition, on your objectives, but you don't have a training on that, no? So I am a bit like the example of a user that Rocio said, but I, I should say it even worse, okay? Because for six years, I was going to the university just to talk about things that I knew, and then back to my job. Now I am a full-time teacher, but my experience of six years is what make me uh, know about the importance of that specific profile that is more than 40% of the universities, of the university uh, teachers, okay? And even though I don't have the figures, I can, it's safe to say that the uh, average teacher is not a tech savvy, not online teaching experts, I mean, in the case of our partners, they are an online university, but uh, plenty of universities, it's a, a physical teaching experience, and then at some point you develop online content, or maybe, as in my case, I have just one group that is online. Okay, so this is the most advanced technological, uh, advanced material that I ever created before Edison, which is a PowerPoint with my face here giving the explanation. Okay, so that is the kind of material that I use in my online classes. But also the average teachers are interested in improving the student's engagement in the online sessions and my particular interest is to explore more about the hybrid learning, okay? In the same course and with the same group, experience offline and online uh, training. So the one million dollar question is, is an average teacher capable of using Edison solution to create engaging content for their online students, okay? So in the next slides, I will give you what is my experience 
with this, my lessons learned. So uh, for my profile, and now I am talking of my own experience, there are like three challenge, a threefold challenge, all the aspect coming together, which is learning to use the tool, learning to use Edison, learning to be a film director, or to think as a film director, and learning to feel comfortable in front of a camera. Okay, because you are all from the audiovisual sector, and you probably say, oh, is this a challenge? Yes, it is if you are not from the sector. Okay? So, learning to use Edison. Okay? It's an amazing tool, as I think some of the, the teachers that they, uh, that Rocio explained it, they think. It's very complete, but it's still very complex for average teacher, non-technical user, to, to use it, because this way of, this kind of display, this way of showing the information is easier for some uh, profiles, but for sure not for me or for some of my, most of my colleagues. So the, the interface is still for experts. You need to memorize or read. But once you know the steps, the results you get are fantastic. And, but you need to know that in order to include a log in your presentation, then you have to go there, 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 and then you have it written, and you follow, and it's okay. But it's not intuitive if you are not an audiovisual expert, okay? It's better to have a certain ability with software and application. It's better, but it's not compulsive. You need to think in three dimensions to achieve results that worth the effort. Otherwise, your whole presentation will be you sitting in uh, in a table with no movement and the displays going on, and you have to remind yourself when creating, oh, I can move through the whole space. And it takes time to align all the ideas in your head while you are creating the content, but when you success, the results really worth the, the effort, okay? The second challenge is learning to be a film director, because Edison is most of all an innovative mise-en-scene, a staging for your classroom, okay? So it's not something that will change the way you share the documents or the material with your, uh, with your students, but the way you are present in the classroom and they feel part of the same uh, virtual scenario. So, because it's a mise-en-scene, it's not only good content, what is uh, important. Good content, good training content, of course, is the most important part, but not only. You have, uh, I mean, your classroom, my classroom is my natural environment, so I move from one place to the other, and I talk to the students, and I feel like in my own house, but this is still not your natural environment, and you have to make that environment uh, yours so you can get all, this, all the results that you, that, uh, that you can use with, uh, with that. So, when you're in a classroom, you don't usually stay the whole session just sitting and passing the... I don't know, maybe uh, there are teachers who do, but I think most of them, because I see your faces, you are smiling like, well... <laughs> but we, we uh, prefer like to move or not to make it uh, boring for the, for the students. So, what I learned is that with Edison in pre-recorded sessions, it allows you, because you have time to think and to program, okay, and when I uh, uh, pass the second slide, then I will have the camera movement, so you can think of everything, you have your script, so the result is okay. But in real-time classes, maybe you are so concentrated in talking about the subject, that at the end of the class you will still be sitting in the same place, because you are concentrated and you are not playing with the camera. So this is why I say that you have to have like the, all those, uh, to think like a film director. And I, am, I started to follow some um, content, video content creators that give you small uh, uh, pills of information. But now I look forward to uh, uh, Rocio tips about how to, to do it, okay? <laughs> And the third, learning to feel comfortable in front of a camera is at the same level of challenge 
of the other two. Because for the average teacher, which if you remember, I said almost 40% of teachers are between 45 and 55, we were not socialized with TikTok. Most of us, we don't like to share our image or videos or whatever online because it's part of our privacy. I mean, it's not something natural for most of us. Others, they are really influencers, but the average teacher, we feel like a little bit of, is this uh, class really going to go online? I mean, are my students going to share what I say in class with their friends? It can make you a little bit of, uh, you, get, you have to get used to that, okay? So maybe you can get a bit of a stage fright, uh, especially when you have the actor standing, as Roy was, that he was like a TV presenter talking, you know, so it's uh, like uh, more difficult. And the solution is to practice, because once you see yourself one, two, three, 20 times in a video, then you start to feel comfortable with, uh, with that. But when I talk about this experience to most of my, colleague, my colleagues, they sometimes say, well, I don't know if I will be uh, comfortable in front of a camera. And I say, well, but you are with your computer. Sometimes in those uh, PowerPoints with a video, I say, yeah, but it's not the same. It's just my face in a corner. No? So that's a cultural barrier that we have to, to overcome. And don't panic because your student they are used to, uh, to consume content through video. So it's more strange for you than it's for them, okay, to see the classes in video. And then hair done, makeup done. I mean, it's not that you have to look uh, uh, very, very good, but very professional. Because the first time that you see yourself in video, it's like, no, it, this is not my, my a comfortable area, no? So those are, you have, if you see yourself professionally like dress or uh, your hair or whatever, it, it makes a difference. Be aware of your tics and fillers, the word you say. In my case, it's in Spanish, vale. So when I see myself recorded, I see that every four questions I say vale. So I was not aware of that. Now that I see myself in video teaching, I am trying not to say valley so much, mm -hmm. okay? And choose the right clothes, depending on the background, not only because of this, that is also an image that I think Roy used it, not only not to, to wear the same as the chroma, okay? But also depending on the background, you see your image better or worse, depending on the clothes you. And as I say at the beginning, my particular interest is the, to explore the possibilities of Edison for hybrid learning. That is something that is maybe not directly into the scope of the project, but all the experiences surrounding the use of uh, Edison and Cloud Class, uh, I think are very interesting also for the project. My experience of most of my colleagues, remember, my age, we teach sociology, legal sociology, criminology, is that the pandemic experience with hybrid learning was a nightmare, okay, because once you, you went from physical uh, teaching to online teaching, okay, and that was a change, but you can cope with that. But then the third step was you're going to have half of your students in front and the other half is going to be in the screen. Uh, someone said you see the, the faces. In my case, my students, they didn't uh, turn the video on, so I see... I saw the C, the P, the whatever, and everyone was silent. And I have to teach, not forgetting that I had some <coughs> students online and some others, and how do they interact. That was really much more difficult than the online step, no? And the post-pandemic experience is that in some cases, because we already have some uh, technological um, equipment in the classroom because of the pandemic, in some cases, they say, okay, we have a master, we have uh, 20 students, but we have five more students that would attend if they had the possibility of attending online. So we keep on doing some experiences of hybrid learning when uh, the physical classes were possible. And it was still a nightmare. That, I mean, it was too difficult to make real and interactive class with physical and online. But I do believe that 
hybrid learning is a very good opportunity to fill some gaps in which you may be, uh, not only in pandemic situations, but for unseen situations or illness of one of, of, the, of the students, or just to increase the enrollment rates. You know, because if you have 20, but you can have 25 uh, students in a master, maybe this could be the solution. Okay, so the $2 million question, can Edison be helpful for hybrid learning is the, my particular interest in that I am starting to research on for uh, the project. I think it can make a, a difference, but uh, I would like to explore in which specific learning situations, which is the minimum equipment, equipment uh, needed, will the teachers get used to being in a kind of set with real students and how many screens would we need? Are we able to, uh, to move and to make it natural in that like mix a scenario? I really don't know. Would online students feel more integrated in the class? I don't know. Will offline student feel online student more present? Okay. And is it all in all, is it better with Edison that it, it, that it is right now with a PowerPoint and sharing the screen through Teams? Is it better? I don't know. So what we are, in, we are, we are uh, working currently, uh, we are going to uh, situate one, the Edison desk in, the, in a room in the Faculty of Economics. Uh, we are going to call it Edison Lab also. And we are already recording video for online courses, preparing, preparing conference attendance using Edison, preparing real-time uh, lessons for summer. And in the lab, we are open to teach all the teachers to get their feedback to keep on improving. If I, uh, and if I am lucky enough to get a Rocio profile, in the University of Alicante. That's, I want to support teachers, but I want someone to support me, especially with technical, but not only with technical issues. And also open to audiovisual communication students and drafting the basics of the research for this uh, hybrid education experience. And I think that's all my part. Thank you very much. And if you have any question, we are here to answer. Bueno, pues, hola. Da igual, da igual. No sabe, lo que quería decir es que no sabemos eh, cómo lo vamos a comercializar porque esto es un sector... ¿Qué? ¿Quién lo dijo? Ah, tú. Perdón. No, no sabíamos, no, estaba ahí sentado y no me he girado mucho. No sabemos exactamente cómo se comercializará. Nosotros sí que tenemos una red muy extensa de, de, de distribuidores en todo el mundo, pero están muy especializados en el sector del broadcast y del, del cine. Y esto para nosotros es una aventura. Es decir, ahora estamos empezando una aventura eh, para saber, primero, si esta tecnología es válida para la educación, segundo, si se va a adoptar por parte de, de profesores o de alumnos, y después tendremos que buscar alianzas eh, para gente o, o proveedores tecnológicos con lo que es la, el sector de la educación para poder introducir la tecnología, porque nosotros, por, nosotros mismos no tenemos capacidad, siempre trabajamos con una red de, de integradores o de... Siempre trabajamos con una red de, de integradores. No, oh, sorry. <laughs> ah, that's what, what you were saying. She was saying something, that is, I can understand. Oh, something sorry. About change. I forget about, about the English. Yeah. <laughs> But well, the, 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 the abstract of, of the question about the commercialization is uh, we don't have any idea. We, we have a network of resellers and distributors around the world, uh, but they are very focused on, on broadcast technology. Maybe some of them, they could also, if they know that there's a potential, they could go to, to the universities and offer the product. But maybe we need to start, to start with new alliances 
uh, with companies that they normally provide equipment to universities and to try to, to commercialize that. But from, for the moment, we are just exploring and we don't know if this technology will be adopted or not. So this is for us a, a, an adventure, a commercial adventure. Okay. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, another question. Another question. Okay, I have a question. <laughs> Not so quick. <laughs> okay, uh, the future. How is the future? Is more, more is, is more uh, is near from broadcasting or teaching innovation in virtual in virtual communication. Yeah, I think it's virtual communication. This is nothing to do with broadcast. I think broadcast has more. We are now looking for interaction. That in broadcast you don't know that is not there's no interaction at all. So this is a challenge. How? we can integrate in this kind of our technology that is thought for just unide unidirectional broadcasting, how to integrate the interaction. And this is something that we are exploring and thinking in this project. And uh, there's uh, many, many uses in, inside of the, of the university. You can create this uh, pre-recorded content as, as a training pills. You can have uh, uh, real-time classes, uh, so we don't know uh, exactly, but nothing to do with broadcast. I think is uh, virtual innovation in, in 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 teaching, and we'll see if we can if we, this this technology can be adopted in all the possible cases, or it will be used just in some specific cases. We we don't really know. This is this, the future will will bring us how the technology will will be used. Thank you. Any question? Uh, <laughs> I, I have just uh, a question that uh, this is thought uh, to be seen in a screen, a plain screen, and uh, in our talks we have talked many times about uh, distant learning, well, one of the problems, for example, with teams and these kind of solutions is this grid of squares that you see, and, and this solves the problem for the teacher, but not for the students. Talking about this interactivity you are talking about, so is there some project in mind or something to make it more immersive, let's say, with glasses or something, or to put the students actually inside the room <laughs> and not only the teacher. We have spoken sometimes about this possibility, but I know how, don't know how it is now. Well, this is the next step. First of all, this technology should be adopted by, by the educational uh, sector. And now the technology uh, that we are using, uh, with this technology, we, we can uh, record in a, in a stereoscopic way and to uh, offer the content uh, to the students in order to be uh, visualized with head-mounted displays in a more uh, immersive way. The good thing is uh, we are using uh, virtual backgrounds, and the virtual backgrounds are 3D. So it's very easy to, uh, to visualize what you're viewing or you're watching in a TV in a 3D, in a 3D headset. So yes, we are we are we are researching on this, but for broadcast, uh, you know, virtual broadcast, etc. But now I think uh, it should be, uh, you know, very ambitious to 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 start researching for education because in education we are, I don't know, ten years uh, later in in the use of this technology. So. We'll see now if, if it is adopted, and the second step is to make it more virtual, more immersive, and it's, it, it will be possible for sure. And with the with the networks, uh, etc., that the 5G, 6G, it will be also possible to be visualized in real time, etc. So this is something that we are in another European projects and we are exploring. Now 5G or 6G, well, that is not working well. So <laughs> at least for 
a sending a streaming video in real time because as you know the streaming is uh, the bottleneck is the encoding and the coding and not the, the transmission with for Netflix and everything is okay because it's, everything is is coded and you just need to download and then and, and, and decode it but in real time uh, video is is different, but everything will arrive. I think in five years, everybody will be uh, watching the TV in real time with the head-mounted displays. If they, if everybody wants, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. Mm. GM Playfit is going to. Oh shared now some light upon the feasibility of cloud class uh, used by teachers and students and the challenges of bringing this project to the education market. Uh, as well as the founder of London-based consultancy White Loop, Jim Playford is a learning program development expert. His work focuses on collaborating with learners, educators and others across the learning ecosystem, uh, ecosystem to build transformative learning experiences that engage and inspire. He has particular experience for education and learning in global South countries, as well as deep understanding of the challenges that take implementing impactful learning programs in diverse and resource limited contexts. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we're on. Um, first, um, I want to thank you for all having this meeting in English. Um, I, because of the luck of the country where I was born, uh, I go to these meetings and I'm the only person that is the native English speaker and everybody else is speaking my language. So thank you. Um, Francisco, who I met on a European project about 15 years ago, once said to me, um, He's a very humble guy, he's a very nice guy, he's a friend. He said, I, I can't be as intelligent in English as I can in Spanish. And it really made me think, and I thought, yeah, that's true. So I always appreciate when people speak English. I, your English, everybody's English is amazing. I'm learning Spanish. It's mainly for use in restaurants, so I can, <laughs> and, and bars. But I, one day, hopefully, I can come back and, uh, and talk to you in Spanish, so thank, thank you. Um, and I want to thank um, uh, Enrique, Roy, Rocio for, for the welcome. It's, it's uh, fantastic to be in your beautiful city. I love it here, it's amazing, and uh, I hope to be back many, many times again. So thank you, thank you for your welcome. Um, I'm just gonna talk through, I'll be quite quick, I'll try and be quite quick, because I think the next thing is coffee, so everybody, <laughs> Uh, is, is, is up for that. I'm just going to talk through a little bit about the context for um, bridging what I think is a gap between the technology companies, the innovators, companies like Brainstorm, who have amazing technology, and places like this, educators, uh, colleges, universities, schools. There is a very big gap, but there is also a very big market. So I'm just going to talk a bit about how do we bridge that gap and what are the challenges, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing in this Cloud Class project to try and address that gap. Um, and I think your question earlier was, was a very good one, so hopefully we can talk a bit more about that. I'm not going to give you a big uh, biography of my work, but um, just to say that really my focus is on trying to understand um, how can we create really compelling, really engaging learning experiences? What is it that makes one learning experience really bring people alive? Another learning experience, people are not interested. That's really what I try to do. I develop a lot of learning programs. I work mainly in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, places like Ghana and Mozambique and Zimbabwe. Uh, a lot of programs around life skills. This is a major life skills program, My Better World, that's reached about 10 million, uh, mainly young girl, girls and young women in Ghana and Tanzania and places like that. Uh, 
a lot of work on employability as well. But the question is always still the same. How do we make the learning impactful? Because we, what we know is just being in the room, whether that's a real room like this or a virtual room, just being there for the learning isn't enough. The learning experience has to bring us alive. And, and a couple of people, and uh, Professor Castello mentioned in his opening remarks, and, and uh, you talked a bit about it, uh, Elena, the, the pandemic, I remember seeing uh, my own son, who is now 16, so he was probably 13, I think, at the start of the pandemic. And I walked into his bedroom when we were, we were all at home and the teaching was online. And he, had, he has, somehow, he has lots of computers in his room. I don't know why or how, but he, he's one of those kids that likes his computer. So he has a computer here and a computer here. And on one screen, he has Microsoft Teams and his lesson, I can't remember what lesson is running. And there's a PowerPoint, a big PowerPoint with lots of detail on it and a small square with his teacher. And I think he'd been on that, uh, he'd been on Teams for three or four hours that day and he still had another two or three hours to go. And then on another screen, he's running something like Among Us, the, the, the online multiplayer game. He's running Discord. And I'm saying, what's, what's going on here? And he said, well, we, we can't like, learn with this. So all the kids are on online multiplayer games and communicating on Discord. That's what they're doing. That's what's engaging them, because this screen, that doesn't engage them. And you can't sit a 13-year-old child in front of a PowerPoint for six hours. It just doesn't work. So I, I have sympathy with the teachers. It's not really their fault. They weren't given the right skills, the right training, the right technology. But the point is, there is a gap there. And we have technology, like the Brainstorm technology and others, to bridge that gap. But in, in our case in the UK, it's not in the hands of the teachers. It's not in the schools at all. So that's kind of really what my work in this particular field with technology is all about. So um, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to kind of run through this very quickly. I think the key thing about the Cloud Class funding, unlike some other funding, is it is a commercially focused fund. So the idea is that within two years of us finishing this, pro uh, this project, that we, particularly the commercial partners, Brainstorm, have a product in the market. So we are very focused on that. There are other projects, and some of you will be involved, and I think the OU would be involved in many, which are much more about experimental research and, and so on. They're super fun, those projects. You can explore the whole world and see what, you, see what you find. This is saying we have an idea for a product and we want to get it into the market. The European Commission are very uh, enthusiastic about, you know, growth and jobs and the economy. So this is trying to get into the market. So we have to bear that in mind when we're looking at how do we evaluate, what are we evaluating and so on. So I'll come to that in a second. So this, as I see it, is the challenge. So here we have kind of a Francisco type guy <laughs> with his very fancy digital tools and he's going, wow, I love this, this is great. And here, uh, we have, uh, um, no, I'm not going to say it's Roy, um, <laughs> but we have a teacher, and, and there is a gap. How do we bridge that gap? How do we bring those two together? And we know, I think, and, and some of the earlier presentations talked about this, there is often, from this person, they are under a lot of pressure all the time to teach, to mark, to... Uh, keep their students engaged and so on. And sometimes when this guy turns up and says, I've got this great piece of technology. This guy, I should have put pictures of women, by the way. I don't, this is very gender wrong, so I apologize for that. But this guy, this guy will turn around and say, OK, so you've got some cool technology, but I'm busy. I've got to mark these papers. I've got to go and teach some kids. So it's a real problem. It's a real challenge. But. Also, learning technologies, ed tech, as it's often called, is a huge, huge market. Anybody guess what the value of the global ed tech market was in 2022? Figure in US dollars. 
Anybody have any idea how much, was, how much money was spent on EdTech in 2022? Huh? 10, 10 million? Yeah, 10 billion. Anybody else? 300 billion. So there's a lot of money being spent. Even though my example with my son, it's like the, the, they're using Microsoft Teams and PowerPoint. That's what they're using. So, but it's a huge market. Lots and lots of players going into the market. But we might say this is a bright future. It's super exciting. You know, personalized learning. This is one of the things. Technology, can, can, you can have something different to you, and everybody can have their own learning experience and so on. New learning opportunities like uh, cloud class, new experiences, new dynamics, scale and reach. This is very, very relevant to trying to improve uh, learning in some parts of, of Africa where I work because it's very hard to get quality learning out to everybody and school completion rates are super low. So can you use technology? You know, mobile phones are starting to really take hold in, in, uh, in different parts of Africa. Can you put the learning into the mobile phones of the kids that can be transformational. So it's super exciting. And look at all these happy teachers jumping up in the air. Um, but, and I, this, was, this was my line. I don't know if this is a very easy line to understand because it's got a, a particularly difficult word, but this promising landscape is covered with the dead carcasses of failed technologies. So like the dead bodies. So. This is what we find. There are so many education innovations that never, ever reach the classroom, never reach the, the educators, never reach the learners. Why is that? So it's a super crowded marketplace. Lots and lots of different people trying to get the attention of those who, who, who buy. Education is a very complicated market. Every country is organized differently. Schools are organized differently. Universities run, I mean, anybody, I've, I've never worked in a university, but I've worked with a lot of them. Most people seem to say, universities are quite complicated. <laughs> like, if you want to buy something, you can't just go and buy it. There's a you know, person who's usually quite difficult that says, ah, you know. So complex channels to market. Um, Sometimes these decisions uh, come from, from, a, from a kind of policy level, from, from politicians. The political approach in the UK for many years towards education is frankly about 50 years behind. There is no vision, there is no understanding. They still see education as we line children up and we give them textbooks and we, we do this kind of stuff. So there's no imagination and there's a, there's a fear that the technology might, might be bad. Also, education leaders, so it could be deans of faculties and so on. There is, you know, other pressures. Again, it's not, there's not always the time to say, okay, we'll spend some time looking at this new technology. It could be great. They're under pressure. Teachers, I mean, again, I don't know if it's the same in Spain. Teachers in the UK, constantly under pressure. No time. Both of my parents were teachers. I think that's why I work in education. I, I saw it for myself. It is a hard job. It's hard, it's, it's, the job I do is much easier than the job of a teacher. So you say to a teacher, here's this cool technology, and all you need to do is spend four hours learning it. Uh, maybe not. So, and then you've got learners, and actually this is, um, you know, this, is a, this is a complex point, but learners, you have to kind of engage learners. I think what's been interesting actually about working with the Open University is that the average age of the students in the Open University is, well, I don't know, mid 40s? Mm, 35, 40. Yeah, 35, 40. So actually, a, quite a different profile. And I think what I've learned is not one type of student with one approach to technology. I, I'm not sure really whether amongst you, you all here, you students here, you seem to be broadly a similar kind of age, i.e. young. I'm guessing the, the normal thought is, oh well, students like you are all super tech 
savvy, you love technology, you do all sorts of technology things all the time. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not. But certainly what I think is true is that you have to compete on the same level. I think what's exciting about the cloud class technology is taking from the broadcast sector, broadcasters and people that make TV and people that make films, they're very, very good at holding our attention. Much better, I would say, than a teacher with a PowerPoint. So if you can take some of that production uh, quality and bring it into education, maybe we can kind of hold the attention of these learners who, are, who have very high expectations. And critically, this is a really key point, a real lack of evidence for what works. So what I mean by that is, if you take an education technology and you want to get it into a school or a university, really what you should do is prove that it works. Prove that it has value to learning and also prove how the teachers can use it. This is what, I mean, Rothio was in her uh, study is trying to do. And this means that we can't bridge the gap, the picture I showed earlier, between the innovator and the educator. And on this point, there is a, a lot of uh, focus. I've just been doing some work with a foundation based in Switzerland, and they are putting a large amount of money into the ed tech sector entirely to fund the research and evidence capacity of these companies because they have these statistics. I think that one statistic was something like less than 10% of the innovations that are currently sold into the education market have any proper evidence to support that they work. So when, I, when you say that 300 billion pounds being spent, less than 10% of that 300 billion pounds is spent on things that have actually been proved to help learners to learn, which when you think about it, it's crazy. And so there, is, there are technologies being used now in classrooms that don't work. There are even technologies that reduce learning. There's studies been done on that as well. So we have to take this more seriously. Okay, so I'm sort of conscious, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit. So we need to build the evidence. Now, when, when we think about building the evidence, and this is what we're doing, what we're trying to do in Cloud Class, there's a whole range of different aspects, different elements to what we're doing that we want to look at. So training of teachers is really key. How do we get the, the technology into the hands of teachers? And Elena mentioned this earlier. How do they adopt and kind of use the technology? They need to feel a sense of ownership. How do we develop learning content? Again, we talked about a bit about this. Crucially, what is the impact, particularly on these two key words, motivation and engagement? What's the impact? We need to measure that. Does it help? Does what, what um, Rothschild showed from the history department, does that actually make a difference? Or is it kind of the same? If it's kind of the same, why are we doing it? Let's do something else. Uh, so that, that, that uh, motivation engagement looks at live teaching and pre-recorded content. So in, in, in this project, we're trying to evaluate both using the tool as a live teaching tool, a bit like what Roy was doing earlier. So a, a teacher will teach live within the 3D environment or using uh, pre-recorded content that they developed, which is what Rothio showed you. So there are two modes, the live teaching and the content creation. Again, does it actually have an impact? Um, so we, we, we need to look at the broader kind of uh, response of learners. Do learners like it? Do they think it's just like a gimmick, like a novel thing, but it's just not really very interesting? Or do they, are they really engaged? Obviously, we then need to look at the teacher perception of the value and the learner perception of the value and so on. So there's a whole bunch of things, but there's more. How feasible is it to implement the technology? So if you bring the technology to an institution like this, this university, how do you get it into the, the system? I mean, we're very lucky here because Roy is here. He has this long relationship with Brainstorm, so he knows how to kind of implement the technology within this institution, but every institution is different. We need the technical validation, by which I mean we need to know that if you run the technology on a certain uh, platform with a certain uh, uh, bandwidth or whatever, that it actually works, it doesn't break down and so on. So it's not just about validating the impact, it's about validating the technical kind of capabilities. 
What's the role of technology support? Again, we talked about this kind of, do we need, does everywhere need a Rothio or a Roy or, you know, both of them? How does it integrate into existing technologies? Every single institution, particularly universities, run learning management systems, they run, maybe they use Teams, they use Zoom, they use Collaborate, they use all of these tools. How does it integrate with what's already there? What's the route to market? And I talked about, a bit about this earlier. How does Brainstorm sell this technology to USC? Who do they phone? What's the process? Does it have to be a tender? Do they have to get competitors to, 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 to offer and so on? Link to that, and this, this was your point. What's the, how much does it cost? If we say to USC, this is gonna cost 50,000 euros a year, do they laugh and put the phone down? If we say it's 5,000 euros a year, do they say, okay, now you're, now you're talking. So we need to know that. What's the business model? And what other kind of wraparound services would someone like Brainstorm have to offer to support the use of this technology? So there's a lot. There's a lot that we need to do. It's not just the impact on learners, although I think for me that's the most important, because if it doesn't impact on learners, let's do something else. But then it's everything around that. So what we hope to get from this evaluation that we're running, and I think um, uh, Kate will talk a bit more about the evaluation later, Evidence that it actually works, we hope, maybe it doesn't, but we hope we, we have evidence that it works. Some stories that show how it can work. Here is, it, like, like Roth here has already told one, here is a teacher that did this and it worked. That's really helpful in bringing it alive for other teachers. Uh, feedback, so we've, all, we've already gone through some of this, so the teachers might say, okay, this bit's great, but this bit we don't understand. Or it would be great if we could have this button that did this. So we get feedback from the uh, from the process, a better refined approach to how we train and bring people on board. This is critical. At some point, you need to actually tell the teacher about the technology and give them the information they need to use it. And if they don't understand it at that point, we're, we're finished. And then a kind of toolkit for implementation. How do we go from picking up the phone saying, we've got this great technology, can we show you more, to it's now being used in the institution. It's a complex process, so we need to understand that. And a business plan, commercial strategy, and ultimately, a chance to get the technology into the hands of teachers and learners. And, and this is my mission with White Loop, a meaningful contribution to improving learning, so that hopefully, the next group of students who are learning online or learning face-to-face, -face, their experience of online or digital is a bit better than a slide and a small head in the corner of a screen. So, we're gonna work with teachers and learners to understand the impact, explore the implementation, integration support issues, document our findings, gather these stories, build a case for cloud class, translate that into a business plan and a commercial strategy, and transform learning. Gracias. <laughs> We're a bit late, sorry. What's your feeling about the future of this technology? Of, of this technology? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think it's a very, there's a very big gap between the capability of the technology in this area, our capabilities and our produce really good quality visual content. Again, to use my son as an example, he is a YouTuber, he produces really good quality videos, films at home quite quickly. Like, that wasn't possible 10 years ago. So I think the technology that's in the world in many areas actually, is, is going faster than the technology in education. And I think if we can speed up, I think there's so many possibilities for this kind of technology because it is engaging, but it has to be more than just novelty. It has to be more than just fun. It has to be better learning. That's, that's the key. 
but I think the, I think the potential is, is very, very big. Very, very big. Well, I hope the got was good and tasty. We must continue with, with the conference. Now it's time of the researcher Katarina Holopinta from the Open University of the Netherlands. Katarina is a PhD student. She has a master's degree in foreign language learning and literature studies from the Kiev National University University and another master in education, media and e-learning from the FEM Universität in Hagen, Germany. Uh, her research topics include instructional design, motivation and collaboration in built to learning environments. Within the Cloud Class project, Katerina is bringing together the technology, pedagogy and educational design to make the learning process effective, efficient and enjoyable. Her presentation is entitled Cloud Class Usability Validation Step Set and Steps to be Taken, as we have been doing during the morning. It will be time later for some questions, and I hope a fruitful debate together. So, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having us here uh, today. And I have to admit that I'm impressed by the city, the hospitality, the food the amazing university setting, seeing you here today, because our university, frankly, looks very different from this. And um, yeah, Renate de Groot today, my professor, I hope uh, she also has, I mean, I see a very similar feeling. Um, and also Cory uh, Erlings, who's joining us today online, and uh, hopefully Roland Klemke, who is, um, going to be back on track after his accident. Um, yeah, so they, they all have probably a very similar feeling because uh, this is what our university looks like. And although there are quite many buildings here, uh, you don't see students there. So mainly employees, teachers, um, support team. And uh, our students could look like something um, like this. So uh, it's a distance university where you can multitask, having a job, a family, a vacation, a sports career, and studying at the same time. And as you mentioned already, the uh, average age is a bit later. So it was also meant to give um, an opportunity to people who did not manage to have a degree at, yeah, in the usual way, uh, most of us do, uh, or also to have a second degree or a second career. But sometimes our, uh, our students look like this, or even like this. So not everything goes smoothly, and it could be challenging at times. And uh, of course, the teachers also don't quite look very similar. And as Elena mentioned, uh, you are an expert in um, your subject, in, for example, law or history, but not necessarily have a lot of experience teaching, maybe face to face. And if here you see your teachers and you can react to what they're doing, um, many of our students usually read text, a lot of text watch some videos, maybe have some online sessions with the teachers. So teachers also don't often know or don't always know how to exactly help the students and what the students are going through. So uh, there is definitely a gap, Jim was talking about, between the practical situations the teachers or stu and students find themselves in and the possibilities of technical solutions. And as in COVID, we all remember that teachers were there, students were there, online tools were somehow also there, but somehow it did not work all the time. And uh, if we think about that situation, uh, then, I mean, these practical problems and the technical solutions need something in between. Of course, solutions can help solve the problems or problems can inform the new uses of the tools, but there is something going on in between. And if we look closer into it, uh, we see that apart from technology and some uh, learning situation, 
a very specific context, whether it is a primary school, uh, an online higher education, uh, or anything else, there is some pedagogy involved. My background is in education, and um, so we do research, and you, um, well, as an educational expert, you know how to design certain things. So, for example, now you can switch your attention from me, just looking at me alone, to the slides, looking at the slides alone, or sometimes us, bo us, us both together. What is better in the online learning? Do you just have the speaker, just the slides, them both, in which order, just text, text and sound, the image, and like there's so many questions, and it's sometimes so counterintuitive if you ask teachers to do certain things. So this pedagogy, basically, it um, yeah gives us hints and recipes so that we don't need to reinvent the, the wheel as a teacher or as a student, and we know exactly what works and how. And uh, this kind of is linked to instructional design. So knowing how learning works, and also there is um, specific didactics for each subject. So for maths, you need certain strategies for law, you need other things. Uh, also, this instructional design bridges pedagogy to the learning design and actually uh, gives you some guidelines. And the paradox of it all is that there is a lot of knowledge here, there is a lot of knowledge here, there are amazing tools here, teachers also have a lot of insight in what their students are and so on, but somehow this whole, it does not work altogether. So, um, we need to bring it all together and make it kind of a collaborative and um, experimental space so that each of these bubbles kind of connects and uh, we, in this experimental way, get to know what is possible in a specific context with the specific tools and with everything that we have by now, like connecting all these dots together. So uh, this brings us to the framework of design-based research as opposed to traditional research when you have a hypothesis like this water is better or healthier than that bottle of water and then you test the hypothesis like you run experiments, you give some group of people just that water to drink, the other group of people the other water to drink and then you see what happens. Then you, okay, so that water is better, it means that whatever and then you have the outcome. In our situation, it works in a different way. So we really need to, to test something. It first needs to exist. So we need to design it. And if nobody knows how to design it, we all need to come up together with the possible solutions, discuss which ones are better, and uh, then test it. But so we need to start with the analysis of the practical problems and the issues, then together try to develop these solutions, and then maybe this is just the first solution, maybe it's not the best one, so we then need to test it and improve it, to then uh, tell that we know now that this uh, solution works, or doesn't work, and why, and then just move on from there. With this in mind, we have done some studies, and there are more, we would like to do. Uh, the first three uh, were about the needs analysis, so like looking into what the situation is and what is possible. And uh, the major studies will be designing those learning solutions or learning experiences in a collaborative way to then validate them and see what effect it has on learning and the students. And uh, we have finished the data collection for these uh, studies, which is basically group concept mapping and in-depth interviews. And we're now busy with the design-based research study, designing those learning solutions. I will now walk you through some of these studies in detail. So the first one, group concept mapping, is um, sounds a bit complicated, but actually it's quite an... Uh, interesting um, methodology and uh, a really very well developed and robust methodology which allows to um, 
get the um, opinion and uh, uh, thoughts of a large group of people and structure it in a specific way. So in our case, we asked the um, at our university, we asked maybe like yeah, it's a bit of a complex process, but we asked all the uh, teachers, uh, technical support experts, and um, managers to give their opinion on what the uh, so this was the focus prompt to use implement cloud class in education. It is required to or needed to, and they all from their different perspectives gave opinions on what they thought is needed for such a tool to work in, in such a big institution. Then, uh, yeah, so this is the participation from the Open University. So we have some teachers, technical support experts and managers. And quite interestingly, the same card in uh, the uh, University of Santiago de Compostela uh, with, uh, yeah, very similar card. So it's interesting also to compare these two very different um, universities and uh, so then we came up with um, yeah 350 statements and uh, we reduced them or basically refined them to just over yeah uh, under 100 statements which gave us quite a broad perspective on all the possibilities for using this tool in, in um, an educational institution like that <clears throat> But that was not it. Then we asked the participants to sort them and rate them. So sort them into groups, meaningful groups that made uh, sense to participants and uh, give them ra the rating of importance and feasibility. So how a crucial certain factor is or not. Which then resulted in, uh, yeah, the, uh, all the faculties uh, participated in that. And it resulted in such a point map where each point is a statement, so an idea about the implementation of um, cloud class in that university with uh, the different, again, ratings for feasibility and importance. And we were able then to see the clusters of important factors like, and then of course we uh, can have a lot of information on that, that for example, user support is crucial and that all the parties agreed that this was an important point. Or technical affordances that the tool offers need to um, um, yeah, match the needs and which exactly technical affordances were mentioned there. The student perspective is taken into account. There is an evaluation, usually an ongoing evaluation of the tool, and that it fits the um, institutional context. So, of course, this is all important for the long-term um, usability of the tool and implementation. But it also gives an, yeah, an important uh, perspective of all the stakeholders. So this is kind of, we start broad. Then uh, we went a bit more specific for the in-depth interviews with Jim, uh, where we interviewed um, about uh, 20 teachers, asking them about the factors uh, that influence acceptance and use of cloud class and what could be the practical application contexts and learning scenarios. And uh, the experience and expertise of these 20 teachers yielded a lot of understanding uh, of how potentially the tool could be used. Um, and yeah, we'll probably, uh, I'll save a little bit of time, <laughs> and we're not going to go through all of these, but we see that there is a lot of uh, potential value in that tool, and the teachers see it, specifically in um, uh, visualizing and bringing to life the visual context with uh, manipulating 3D objects, uh, uh, potentially enhancing understanding, engagement, motivation, and uh, yeah, accessibility of different professional contexts yeah, from the text-based to the real-world environment. There are also, of course, uh, multiple learning contexts for cloud class. Uh, and um, we specified them here, but also challenges. Many of them were mentioned here today, so um, yeah, I'll probably not be repeating them. And uh, so this was the second component in the needs analysis. The third one being the um, usability testing, so how actually usable this tool is for teachers, which um, 
I mean, the bottom line was that, um, so, yeah, so we asked um, ourselves what is the user friendliness and implementation feasibility and how the training can be improved. And uh, yeah, the bottom line is that, of course, the functionality is there and you can do a lot with it, but it needs to be uh, linked to the teachers, uh, what, what the teachers need to do with this. So now, moving on to the most exciting part of this, um, yeah, the, my PhD basically, and the, the core of the project, we're asking ourselves now what the best practices for teaching with Cloud Class would be. And now we're working on several use cases with different teachers, um, trying to uh, bring it to their classroom. And together with them, in collaboration, designing the best possible learning um, experiences, which will then be shown to other educational experts uh, with instructional design expertise, technology um, uh, background uh, to get some feedback through focus groups and refine the design, with then eventually uh, this learning experiencing the students. And at the final stage, so this will be done with, yeah, again, uh, with developer screening, focus group surprisal and pilot test, and the final stage would be then uh, evaluating it with students. Of course, the core is if, what it does to learning, uh, because the fun part is nice, but if it's just entertainment and brings nothing to learning, then really it's questionable how much added value it is for the learning. So it first needs to, to do something to learning, so ideally improve learning. Then, of course, uh, motivation. We'd like to look into motivation and cognitive load and engagement. So this will all be tested then through questionnaires. And uh, we'll, we'd like to also ask teachers and students how to find the experience of uh, learning and designing with Cloud Class through interviews and focus groups that would then um, help us uh, refine and uh, improve the the design and the process, the workflow. So in the end, we hope to see how Cloud Class can be used in courses at the Open University, what effects it has on student motivation, engagement, cognitive load, and learning, uh, knowledge acquisition, and um, of course, uh, the implementation, feasibility, user friendliness, and how this tool can effectively work in a large educational institution like the Open University. Um, that is about it. So these are uh, nice and exciting plans <laughs> for, for our university. And now I would really like to welcome your questions and thank for your attention. Okay, so uh, I have been uh, looking at your presentation, it's great, uh, Rocio also, you are invest, uh, researching on, on this, but for me, I, I, I'm not sure because uh, sometimes, if I'm not an expert in education, but you know that sometimes you have a teacher mm -hmm. that is not, not transmitting anything, so the, uh, if the, the, the audience is not engaged because the, the, the normal teacher with an, in a normal class is not, is not engaging the, the audience, uh, we don't know if with this system is going to be better or not. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, if you put some teachers, some teacher that is not not engaging the audience in this kind of environment, maybe the 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 the, the output of the or the feedback from the audience is negative, uh, because maybe the audience is the first time that that they uh, they have this this lesson with this with this teacher. So for me. Is something that, if for, imagine in the, on the other side, 
uh, sometimes uh, there are very enthusiastic teachers that they, they communicate very well and if they put if you put these these teachers in this environment the result is going to be okay mm -hmm. so for me it's, there's some some way to differentiate uh, because now we are we are studying just if 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 the the teacher in the environment mm -hmm. is is engaging or not but but, but sometimes there is a factor Definitely. that is the the teacher yeah. If the teacher doesn't uh, communicate well, even if this in a 3D environment, uh, the, the, the output or the feedback on, from the audience is yeah. going to be negative. So there's something that could we could do mm -hmm. with the use cases saying, OK, this guy or this woman is a very good communicating and mm -hmm. the engagement is good, but with this application is going to be better. Or uh, no, this teacher is not engaging at all. But in we, and with this environment is not or is improving or is not improving. So we can set up a baseline or a calibration, because we say calibration, where uh, the, the, the communication capacity of the, of the teacher is in, in to, into account. Mm -hmm. Sorry, because... Is it a question? Is, is, it's a question. It's a question, okay. yes. <laughs> yeah, because we I need to take it also into account. This is a very important element. Indeed. I think we could, um, with this, communication, um, yeah, parallel, we could think about TED Talks. Every time you deliver a TED Talk, like whatever communicator you are, you, give, you get uh, tips and tricks of how to be an engaging speaker, and then you're trained. And then there are very little chances of failure in this context, because there is training, there is knowledge of how to do that, and uh, there is quality control. I wish we came up with such a system for education. And it's not a cloud class problem, but it's an education and uh, <coughs> educational expertise problem. So if all the lecturers went through the process of TED Talk training, um, I think we would not have those boring speakers. But then again, it's not about the tool. As you mentioned, it's the, the speaker themselves. So I hope with this all, we would come up to like guidelines that TED Talk guidelines, but teaching guidelines in this regard, that would help to calibrate the technology in such a way. That, for example, my PowerPoint was a bit more engaging at the very beginning than at the very end, right? So I could have used some other strategies to make it more exciting, or asked you some questions, or give you a little yeah, thing to, to think about or to talk about, which would make it interesting and and maybe if the PowerPoint reminded me like ah you have used so many slides without any pictures like are you sure you want that much text in there um, that could have helped me to be a better presenter Sorry, I will uh, repeat for the people who are online uh, there. Um, I think ultimately, uh, with with uh, some of our uh, designs, we can uh, really test whether uh, uh, cloud class teaching in cloud class makes the teacher a better teacher or a more enthusiastic uh, teacher if we compare it with teaching as usual like we uh, do. Uh, the other uh, thing, well, what uh, Kate said, when, uh, that people may uh, might, or teachers might benefit from a kind of training, uh, I think that's something we can also learn, maybe even from the television uh, world. Eh? You all have great presenters uh, there, so yeah, maybe teachers have to become uh, presenters, but I think a first step is to show what's the difference between a teacher performing in the cloud class versus the traditional way for, uh, of teaching, whether it's in classroom or uh, in teams or in uh, collaborate ultra like we work with uh, at our uh, university. <laughs> May I add just one thing? I, I am thinking now that uh, at my uh, university and at all universities, uh, I am evaluated by the students because they evaluate each uh, course, the materials I put, if I am a good teacher, if I fulfill the, the schedule, the tutorship time. So there are some um, 
indicators to evaluate my my work. So I would be uh, I would be expecting next year if my evaluation changes after using this. And that's the that traditional way of evaluating teachers. So let's compare what happens. This is, this is at last, definitely. Yeah. But I think to, to, to your point, I, my understanding of the, I think this is what you were saying, Renata, that the, the research design is to run the same lesson with the same teacher and the same content, one in cloud class yep. with one group of students and one not in cloud class with another group of students. Then you can address your, your point. You can say, well, which, so even if the, even if the presenter is terrible and really boring, that are they slightly less terrible and boring in cloud class? Maybe you know. I mean, I mean, for for me, the the challenge. I mean, I, I've been involved in a few of these projects. I think you have to recognise to evaluate this kind of thing, impact on learning, impact on individuals, is really difficult. It's really really difficult because there are so many factors. E even in that scenario, you could say, ah, but one group of learners is not the same as the other group of learners. And that group of learners, they're slightly younger, or they, they, they did the learning in the afternoon after lunch, and they all had a beer at lunch, so they're, you know, they're, they're sleeping. <laughs> but all of these things, you know, people, um, you know, people actually learn better in the morning. There's evidence that says people are more switched on in the morning. So, like, so there's so many factors. For, for me, one of the challenges as well is, is novelty. You know, with any technology, you're trying to evaluate to what extent is the engagement, the motivation, the excitement, just, it's something new. So the first time you see something, you go, ah, this is cool, this is interesting. Like, if you, if you, if you do an educational game in a classroom full of kids, and I've done, the, done these studies, of course, they, when you say, what did you think of the educational game? They love it, because it's a game. And normally, it's just the teacher standing there talking to them. So, it, even if the game's terrible and they don't learn, they love the game because it's just different. So, I, I mean, you can answer it if you want. It's a difficult question. I think ev every study struggles with this. How we work out what the, what the impact is of, of novelty on engagement as opposed to they're actually engaged. I, I mean, I, I don't have an answer for that, but maybe you do. Yes, longitudinal studies, not just running one session, but yeah. running it throughout a course. But, but we can't do that courses. in this project, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in a follow-up study, we could do that for sure. But indeed, uh, for the design, I mean, the, even a good technology in the wrong hands doesn't yield what it's supposed to. I mean, knife can be used for good or for bad. So it can help or harm. And the same is with the technology, especially with learning. So we first need to give it to, in the right hands to know what is the best possible use for it, which we're doing in this design-based research thing. And then we'll know what, which hands are appropriate, <laughs> so, and this is the hope, at least. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to introduce now uh, Antia Mosquera. She's an educational science student here in our university, University of Santiago de Compostela. She's currently in her senior year has participated in several projects which involve educational technology, especially through the use of polymedia and virtual reality. Today she's presenting a case study of a project to exemplify the uses and impact that polymedia has in higher education. Okay, so I'm Antia. I'm very happy to be here and to have this opportunity to learn from all of you, but also to share my experience and especially my point of view as a student. So I'm going to try to keep it very simple because, I mean, this presentation doesn't have much theoretical or technological side. It's more just showing my experience. And I'm going to tell you about the impact of technology in higher education. Because uh, for me, since I first started college, uh, technology has had a big, big impact on how I perceived education and the possibilities that it has. And also, I'm going to present to you a teaching learning experience in which I participated and how the polymedia uh, helped us uh, 
achieve the goals set in this project. So first, I'm going to show to you uh, the way I'm going to structure this presentation. It's going to be mainly four points. First, I'm going to give you a little context on how I first uh, heard about Polymedia. Um, then I will present to you the project we are speaking about, uh, which is the voices of those who cannot scream, invisible women inside the Spanish penitentiary system. Then we will get into the experience that I had with Polymedia uh, last year and also this year. And finally, we'll talk about some conclusions. So we're going to begin with some context. Um, I first heard about Polymedia last year. I was spending a year in Sevilla. And uh, I had this subject called educational technology, in which they told us there would be a lecture about uh, teaching innovation. So I thought, why not? I mean, let's attend and see what it's all about. And um, they told us in this lecture about uh, virtual and augmented reality. They also introduced us to 360 cameras, and I became very interested. So I spoke to the man who was um, giving this lecture, and there was actually an internship. So I decided to apply, and I actually spent three years working with Polymedia and creating a lot of products, uh, especially for teachers. So I've got a first example here, which is actually the first Polymedia we recorded in the institution I was. Um, this is a Polymedia that uh, was recorded for the presentation of an innovation project. Uh, it was presented by Professor Car Carmen Llorente Cejudo. Uh, I don't know how to play it. Um, let's go back, maybe like this, no, okay. Mm -mm. I'm going to continue meanwhile. So basically, our job, uh, me and my colleague, Flavio Arroyo Biosorio, our main job was to help teachers through this technology to share their knowledge with students and other professionals. So what happened here? I was a pedagogy student, yes? So I didn't have much knowledge about uh, software or cameras or anything, really. But my colleague, he was a very expert because he had a YouTube channel and he had some experience with software, with the use of cameras and all of this. So with my pedagogical, uh, pedagogical point of view and his experience, we were able to create a set which was very humble because we only had a green cloth and a camera and later on we actually had a monitor and some lights. But at the beginning it was just us with the cloth and the camera. So what we did uh, was we created a YouTube channel and we would be uploading every single um, improvement that we had. And this was the first um, actual polymedia uh, that we recorded. And as we can see, we detected some necessities from this video. You can tell that the teacher is not very comfortable. She's not moving around much. She's standing still. And she doesn't seem very natural, yes? So uh, apart from this, we also detected that teachers were having some trouble when it came to creating the presentations because they didn't quite know um, how to use color contrast, how to adapt the text to make it more readable, or anything like that. So, <laughs> okay, thank you. So, uh, once we detected these necessities, we realized that we had to give teachers some guidance. So what we did was we created ah, this informative guide that's uh, related to what Rocío said earlier. Yes, it was a manual of good practices. So what we told them about was how to stand, for example, because we had a uh, little space. So if they didn't stand in this square, what would happen was that they would actually step out or even um, interfere with the presentation. So we also told them about how to modulate their voice so the speech would be um, more adequate. And we realized that once that we gave this information to the teachers, before they came in the studio, 
uh, they could actually prepare themselves. They would have some information about the space they were going to be recording in. Uh, they had some information about the um, uh, microphones, the cameras, all of this. And this um, actually was very interesting because they would seem more natural, they would seem more relaxed, and the presentations overall were way better. We also participated in other areas of knowledge, such as this case, um, a multimedia project called Mentescopia, which aim was to spread information about some mental illnesses and their prevention. So what we did was we had an interpreter come in to the studio and we would record her and later on the video would be edited and I will <laughs> try to show you so you can see. So basically what we did was um, we recorded the interpreter and just with the chroma, and she would like give her speech, and later the video was edited, and that was the final product. So it was just not all about education. We also uh, intervened in different areas. Then I will talk about the teaching learning example that I wanted to give you. Um, this was once I, come, I came back to Santiago, I enrolled in a subject called prison pedagogy, and this subject uh, had a project set that we had to create. And um, it, the, pro the project, sorry, was named The Voices of Those Who Cannot Scream, Invisible Woman Inside the Spanish Penitentiary System. So obviously this was a very sensitive project and we wanted to give some awareness, uh, raise awareness in society about this because we believed uh, not many people knew about this, not many people knew about the figure of women inside the penitentiary system. Them. So we wanted to share the information with the educational community, not only the Faculty of uh, Educational Sciences. So in the first meeting, I suggested that maybe we could record a polymedia. And the first time I said the word polymedia, uh, no one knew what I was talking about. Yes, not my teacher, not my teammates. So I tried to explain to them in a very simple way what I was talking about. I showed them a few examples. And once they understood better what I was telling them, um, everybody became very committed. I mean, they were not quite sure what the final product would look like, but they were interested, they were engaged, and they wanted to participate. So that's what, it would, what we did. We used polymedia technology to communicate the data that we collected. How did we do this? Well, first, mm -hmm. as the only person who had some experience, I tried to give them a little bit of uh, guidance on how the presentation should look like and how the video overall should look like. So we began by summarizing all the data we collected. We decided the video shouldn't be longer than 10 minutes because uh, if it is longer than 10 minutes, people don't really get engaged and they get really bored. So um, then we had to create a PowerPoint presentation we tried to fill it with images, drawings, graphics, I mean, everything we could so that the topic, which was a very difficult topic, um, just make it simple. Because if you don't make a topic simple, people just get bored and they get lost in details. Then uh, we tried to create an inclusive design uh, from our pedagogical point of view. We know that sometimes people, when it comes to designing a presentation, don't really take this into account and there's people with visual impairments and we try to, for example, use color contrast, uh, use the same font in every slide, readable text, all of this. And finally, we have to decide uh, which, who was going to uh, present. Yes. So we decided there would be only two people, so the recording process would be easier. And it was decided that it would, it would be me and another colleague, Ana García Leston, who would record the, the presentation. Now, uh, the experience with Polymedia, the recording process, um, we had an issue because we didn't really know where to record this Polymedia. So our teacher, Mar Lorenzo Moledo, uh, was the one who actually contacted with Roy Méndez and Enrique Castelló, uh, who helped us with our project and introduced me to Rocío Sosa, who would later be the one in charge of recording us. So when we first got to the uh, set, I have to say it was uh, nothing like the one I had been working on in Sevilla. It was huge. I mean, you can see that's me. Uh, standing right there, it was like, um, what am I doing here? It was filled with cameras, filled with lights. 
it was just so, so scary. But uh, Rocío <laughs> was very kind, and she really explained all the process, uh, how everything worked. Uh, she told us about the different shooting plans, about the cameras, where to look at. And we also had a screen uh, monitor uh, where we could see ourselves while we were recording, which made things quite easier because you knew how to move, you knew if you were in the right position when the presentation came in, if you were like covering the images or anything. And um, I mean, it was a, a really, really interesting experience for me as a student. And I think that this product uh, really shows a difficult topic in a very easy way. So I want to show you a little bit. This is the final product that we created. That's me standing on the set. and. Um, we basically wanted to show the figure of women in the penitentiary system, and we finally created a product that was just six minutes long, which I think was very uh, interactive. I think it was very easy to follow, and once we actually published this project and we shared the Polymedia, the feedback that we got back from our colleagues and other students in the Faculty of Educational Sciences told us that they loved it. I mean, they asked us, how did you do it? Um, how did you create this product? And they really, I, I got the sense that they really understood what we were trying to tell them, which was the first goal. So, finally, going to conclusions, um, I wanted to show you how the spreading of knowledge of this project went. We basically, cre we basically created a few infographics. Uh, each one of them was focused on one approach. Uh, the project was structured in seven points of view. And what we did uh, was we created this QR and we, implement, we implemented the polymedia in every single one of them. So the students would come in and they could just, uh, on their mobile phone, they could watch the video. And since it was a very short video, um, they could just uh, ask us questions right there and then, which made the process uh, very interesting. I think that um, these infographics, uh, by using the images and by using the polymedia itself, it um, helped people to really understand what we were trying to say. And also, it is planned that the project will be resumed next month, and the Polymedia will be published in different media. So it can be um, even published in uh, some social media we've got. And finally, the impact of Polymedia in higher education. Um, I'm a student, so I have a lot of <laughs> uh, um, things to learn, and I am still learning. But what I can say from my point of view is that nowadays, uh, there's everything is globalized, and there's information everywhere. But as they were said before, not every information is valid, and not every uh, technology that is being used actually engages us. Because sometimes there are videos, there are um, animations, there are infographics that don't really engage us. So by using Polymedia, it allows people to go further into a topic. It attracts students because it involves many different um, multimedia, like pictures, videos, 3D, everything. And it is overall very groundbreaking because, as I said before, when I proposed this idea, nobody knew what I was talking about. So I think it's something that uh, can be really researched, and there's a lot of work to do. Uh, it also promotes creativity, motivation, and curiosity. Like I said, I mean, this was a very dense topic. Uh, there were lots of information. It was not very fun. But through this project, what I got as a feedback from my teammates is that they became very, very engaged, and they really wanted to participate, and they would research more information so they could add it to the Polymedia, and they were overall very motivated. And finally, uh, students acquire an active role in their education. What I mean by this is not just, OK, we're going to research about this topic, and then we're going to answer some questions in class, and that's it. Because the knowledge you get from that is very superficial. But by doing this, it actually makes you get into it, yes? And I think it makes you more active in your education. So that's it. Thank you.
Hi. Hi. Uh, I have a question. Uh, when you prepare that, uh, you had to do more work of preparation than in a, another type of uh, work that you do as a student? Because this is a, a, a work that you have mm -hmm. done as a student, right? Yeah. So it was a lot of work more in your side to prepare this? I think it was not perceived by me as work. I think it was perceived by me as an opportunity and a different way of learning. And I, I, I also wanted to show my teacher that by um, suggesting this project, we could um, make it creative and we could make something different. So um, again, I had some previous experience. So for me, it was easier than for the rest of my teammates. But I remember last year that we created this YouTube channel. We did it uh, especially for that because we would be uploading every single improvement. So by seeing myself in front of the camera, I could actually um, perceive some of the errors that I was committing and then uh, improving from there. I understand that for somebody who has zero experience, it can be perceived as work. For example, my teammate, Anna, who came with me to record the Polymedia, she did indeed have to prepare herself a little bit more and to practice more, and it was harder for her. But even in that case, uh, she was enjoying the process. So no, we, I don't think we perceived it as work at any moment. Um, just, it's a very interesting story. Thank you for sharing it. Yeah. How, how, in you, based on your experience, how do you see that this technology could be more widely used by students at, at a university like here, or, or, or do you? Could, is it is it feasible for lots of students to do something like what you did, or is there something else you think students might use this for? I think that students, I mean, anyone can use this technology because if I have done it with zero experience, I mean, anyone can. I just think it comes um, to, the, to the moment where you think, okay, I don't know how this works. I don't quite understand how this is going to go, but I am interested. I perceive it as something positive. I think it's going to impact in my process of learning, and I'm going to do it. But I understand that for some students, I mean, it comes to the uh, very um, same example as teachers. Sometimes students do not have enough time for this because, I mean, some students work, uh, some students have different um, things, and they don't have enough time. But I think anyone can actually get involved with this kind of technology, and it can help everybody. So, yeah. But, but they would need Rocio yes, alongside them. Yes, they would need guidance, just, just as well as uh, teachers who were... Uh, we, for example, had many uh, professionals who had been teachers for over two decades. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with their experience. I mean, everybody needs guidance, but I think that with small tips, just by telling them how to stand or how to gesticulate, anyone can do it. But yes, there's the need of a figure who guides them through the process, of course. <laughs> Really exciting things you're doing with both cloud class recording and polymedia. So good luck further on. Thank you. And usually when you try something, then you end up uh, wanting more. Mm -hmm. So what would you like to further do with uh, cloud class mm -hmm. and with polymedia then, I mean? Well, um, that's a good question because me, myself, I have no idea. I mean, I, um, the more that I study and research, the more that I perceive that there are no limits because last year we were even uh, experiencing some virtual and augmented reality. We were just uh, improvising and making some little practices, but we even uh, got involved into virtual, um, virtual reality immersive experiences. For example, one of our colleagues, uh, she was designing a virtual experience through the Faculty of Educational Sciences. And we actually helped her with that. We recorded her. And I was perceiving that there was much more that we could actually do with Polymedia and Cloud Class and many other technologies that were mentioned here. But yeah, I think there's no limits. Just have to get right into it. Thank you. That's a yeah. great approach. <laughs> like, anything is possible. Thank you very much. This was very uh, overwhelming, I would uh, almost say. But I'm 
pretty curious. Uh, many of you here now in the audience are also uh, students. After having heard all this, um, how do you think you would like it or not to uh, being taught in a cloud class uh, environment? And the other way uh, around, do you see benefits for yourself to work and design something of your learning material in an environment like cloud class? So what is your impression now from cloud class? And if we first start with the first question, indeed, eh, to be taught in cloud class. Well, I think uh, this kind of education is really taking to a next step the traditional education that we came from. Because sometimes we are stuck in this kind of education where we um, came from repetitive things and like industrial revolutionary stuff. And now we're going to like be able to um, experiment in things like virtual reality, where you can find some, imagine an anatomy class where the teacher can put a big bone in front of the class and can show it around and some kind of this stuff. And also I think this is going to be really interesting in some countries that are in a very lower in a very lower economic position where you can just don't um, build schools from scratch because it's really expensive and obviously this is really 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 better than using a, a teams with the lower web webcam and, and that stuff Um, well, this is just my opinion, so don't take it very seriously. But uh, I believe that this is a good, a, a very good idea, actually. But I think that the project project is like hanging a very thin line, because if it's, if it's well handled, it could become a a very good way of learning, a very interesting thing. It's something that we can look up to, like uh, experience new th new ways of learning. But it's also uh, very difficult to not uh, fall in the topic of, just like uh, you said before, like uh, it's another Sky Skype or Teams or, or those, that sort of things, like something we, we have on our computer in this screen and in this screen among us again. So I think that it could become something very, very good, but it's also very difficult to treat. And so for me, uh, I'm just going to wait here and see how it develops and hope it turns out well. But I, I wish you the best. <laughs> and uh, it's. It's it's difficult, but I hope it 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 succeeds, and that's it. I think that it's uh, in it's it mm, it's like in the first stage of the project. Like it needs to be a little more, maybe a little more, maybe interaction, interactivity, for, for example. Uh, maybe the, it's new. It's obviously going to catch atta attention because it's new. Everyone is going to be, oh, wow, it's like a screen and you can turn the camera on. But once you get over that, get over that, uh, you need to keep evolving and keep Alien things, so people don't lose interest in, interested, interest. I don't know how to say it. Uh, <laughs> uh, interest. So, um, I think it's like a very constant. Uh, technology is always evolving, so you need to keep up with those things. You need to be fast, and you need, you need, it needs to be more 
Mm, how do you say it? Interactive thing. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I think it's difficult, but as Katarina said before, we have to take into account the pedagogical and the technological side, and we have to work together, because if we only take into account the technological side and we say, oh, yes, this technology is great, it's going to you know, engage students, it's going to show really good feedback, but we don't have uh, professionals in education who actually say, okay, hold on, this is uh, going to work, this is not going to work, and this is why, yes? And also to validate every single technology that we put out there, just like Jim said. Uh, there are lots of technology that we think at first are going to be great and end up being just, you know, uh, like you said, another Skype, another Teams, whatever, because they have not been validated correctly. So I think that uh, as students, if we can take an active role and if we can help and participate and give an actual feedback, not just like responding to a questionnaire and saying, oh, yes, this class was great and this teacher is great. Uh, no, we have to actually give the chance because not everybody has the chance, and I get that, but if we are given the chance, we should all try and participate. And I can tell you right now, I mean, this group group that helped us uh, was 30 people who knew nothing about technology and who knew nothing about polymedia, but working all together with the help of Rocio and Roy and Enrique, we made it work. So I hope this gives you some hope. <laughs> and yeah, thank you. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, you know? So um, about five years ago, there's, a, there's an education technology show in London called BET, B-E-T-T. -T. It's on next month, actually. It's the biggest education technology show in the world. And I went there about five years ago, and there was a stand uh, probably about the size of this room with uh, a company that had VR headsets for secondary school kids. Um, I don't know a school, that's five years ago, I don't know a school in the world that has VR headsets in sec with secondary school kids. And that company spent, I think Brainstorm actually has, has had a stand at BET. It's really expensive to have a stand, like to have a seat at BET is about $1,000. To have a stand like this is like hundreds of thousands of dollars. That company isn't around anymore. So we know we can have VR headsets, it's really cool, but it doesn't work in a secondary school with a class of 30 kids all walking around with VR headsets. It doesn't work, you know. So, but they thought, it, they thought it did work, or they thought it was cool, but just being cool isn't enough. It has to, that's, I mean, that was kind of my message in my presentation. So you're absolutely right. I think we need people to push back and say, okay, yeah, I, I like it, it's, it's fun, it looks excellent. Ah, uh, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not working. Yeah. Just because I have it doesn't mean I should use it. Um, so I, this, this, is, this is what we need. We need to be very honest with ourselves. And I'm sure Brainstorm, I'm sure you would agree. It's like, people, your, your technology is cool. And you see, you go, wow, it's, it's like on the TV. But just because we can do it doesn't mean we should. And that's what we're doing in the project. Should we do it? That's the question we're really answering. Should we do it? Maybe the answer is no. We'll find out. It's not working. It's working. It's working. It's working. It's working. Also, a quick follow-up. You see, you raised a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of um, reactions. But if we think, I mean, we were discussing it uh, yesterday. I think that about 20 years ago, internet started, and now we're living. I mean, any like higher education, I mean, overall, this is an ecosystem. And uh, you are a student, there is a university, there are teachers, it's a working ecosystem. With the internet and all the online services, we have, as you said, Skype, Teams, something else, something else, something else, something else, uh, different things, and they're not integrated. So I hope there comes a time when we bring all these bits and pieces, like now we are doing for developing that single tool, we we'll bring all these bits and pieces of different functionalities of different technology, think about the whole workflow of something, and then make an ecosystem where everything is integrated and usable and uh, 
Let's hope it's coming soon. <laughs> Yes, I, I have a question, okay, for you. Um, after the, the pandemic experience, okay, um, what do you prefer, a cloud class system or your traditional professors face-to-face -face, or maybe a hybrid, hybrid model? What do you prefer? Feel free, Don Billy, please. Well, I kind of prefer the traditional way because uh, it grants a smoother interaction between teacher and student. For, in, for instance, if I have a doubt, I can just raise my hand and you will un immediately answer. Meanwhile, during the... Yeah, well, we didn't use Teams that much. We were more of the Skype type, so... <laughs> but uh, it's true that... Uh, it somehow it feels I feel more integrated in the class than when I was in the Skype um, classes, and I don't know why it might be psychological. I don't. I don't I'm not really sure, but uh, it's true that uh, perhaps feeling some that you're somehow integrated in the class and no and not in your home, which I think is somehow the cloud class may fix in the future, like for all of us. I think that's the key for people to really focus on, on class and not be distracted by anything that could uh, pop up in your monitor. And I think that's about it. Anyone? Uh, personally, I believe that nothing can truly replace a real live interaction in a real life class. I do think that projects as such that are being proposed here are uh, very nice as uh, as company as help as a support for a um, for a press uh, for a um, <laughs> normal class or as tools for um, fully online courses as the uh, university uh, that you are presenting. But in um, but in my opinion, nothing can truly truly replace uh, a an in real life class. I do think. Uh, that uh, these tools are incredibly helpful for projects as such that you are presenting for uh, a small uh, videos that condense information that would otherwise be incredibly difficult to consume. I think a lot of us have been in the situation in which maybe a five minute long video on YouTube was way more helpful to understand a topic than a wired one hour long class. So um, sometimes tools as such are very great to have um, ready to uh, consume at any point and sort of um, help with with the overall um, experience of learning. But uh, in my opinion, nothing can, it, there, there is not, at least not currently, an option that can fully replace the, the experience of a, a present uh, in real life class. <laughs> what, what do you think, as teachers, which do you prefer? <laughs> I completely agree with her. Uh, I think that uh, we are humans and we need to see each other. Uh, we need to look at the eyes of the other person. And you as a teacher, you need to see your students sleeping, for example, just to <laughs> try anything, just to avoid that, for example. Uh, yeah, if they are, uh, that's why I ask uh, Chicho, for example. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, and the thing is, that the question I asked before Chicho was in in that sense. The if maybe in the future nowadays not possible. He explained why, but maybe in the future if we share a common space and you see your partners. Okay, it's not the same, but it's more similar, and it gives different possibilities, but I think these alternatives will not substitute face-to-face uh, -face, uh, teaching. It will complement it. 
and in in some universities like the OU, which are distant uh, learning, of, of course, it's an immediate uh, win, for, in my opinion. But in traditional institutions like ours, I think uh, creating content just to support your classes or for the students to look at it after the class or before and then discuss in class, I think it's a very uh, powerful tool. But all technologies, I think, uh, will never substitute uh, seeing a person by your side. I, I think that's... I don't know if you want to say something. The last thing is, uh, is that's true. That's true. No, nothing is better than being face to face. That for sure. But there are some some universities like uh, Open University of Netherlands that is remote distance learning. So there are a lot of universities that they work with remote learning, and remote learning needs better systems. And that could could help. We don't know. And on the other side. Uh, you know, there was a, an interview which was very, very funny to one guy. I said, are you going to the university? No, because everything is in, is in YouTube. And uh, my, 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 my son said, yes, well, I, I'm going to, to class, but sometimes if I don't understand something, I look for a nice video where he will explain in YouTube. So this technology can help also to prepare very good content and to put it in a repository or in a YouTube and then help you, a part of the class, as a complement, to understand better the class. So maybe this is the future. Of course, not replace. We, we are not interested in replacing. And for the future, for sure, we are working in several projects, etc., where we are going to share people with headsets in, a, in the same space, in the same classroom, etc. But what is the bad thing? That everybody will be captured with the headset. But we with deep fake technology you can replace the and put your real face etc so we are researching on that but this is 10 uh, 10 years further huh, from now I, I just wanted to say that the proof that face to face is is the most interesting thing or the best alternative is that they are here <laughs> and they are not in Valencia exactly. or the Netherlands or London and they came here just to see each other yesterday we were all the day discussing this project and now we are sharing with you and with us also what we are doing we were talking about that with Jim in the coffee that it's nice to see the in depth what we are all doing so we could do this by teams yes but it's not the same near uh, similar we went yesterday for dinner for example and you can replace that <laughs> with teams yeah I was going to say yeah, yeah. you have to be there like, be front. Yeah. yeah we have a lot of re remote uh, meetings but when we want to create a confidence when we want to create a team or to build a team uh, is necessary to have face-to-face -face meetings because these create l connections and links and then you can start thinking uh, sorry talking with uh, the rest of the group in a more confident way because you have been face to face and you have see, you have seen uh, you have seen the, the eyes of the of the of the other people and then you create this kind of confidence but as soon as the confidence is created you can work uh, in a remote mode. So, of course, this technology should, any te technology should, uh, should uh, work with, with a normal um, a physical relation. Okay. For me, that's the point that, that you're, you're not trying to replace face to face. I mean, I, 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 I train, I don't teach kind of officially, um, but I train people particularly in, in I train trainers usually in, in different parts of Africa and that all stopped face to face for the pandemic and just recently I've gone back out and the difference being in the room for, for me as an educator is it's completely different. It's completely different. And and I, I was like, no, this is this is what I want to do. But I think there is still, like we talked about today, such a big gap between the experience of learning online, and I mean, the, the, I mean Renata may, may or may not agree with this, but it, let's say, it's my, in my opinion, there's quite a big gap because of the, you know, the, what Chicho was saying, the relationships, the, the eye contact, the being aware of who's in the room, the, those things. But technology can help us close that gap because I think what's very clear is online learning, distance learning is growing. It's not going away and actually, there's the potential to give a lot more 
education and learning to a lot more people by doing it online. I mean, we're all very lucky to, to be able to go to a university. I went to university as well. It's, you're lucky. Most people in the world don't get to go to university and get to sit in these wonderful places and learn from each other. So it is an opportunity to close that gap. So we should be saying, how do we make this online experience better? Not, it won't be the same. It can't be. But there are ways that we can make it better. And I think maybe Cloud Class is the kind of technology that can help make it better. That would be my view. You want to say something, don't you? <laughs> I'm thinking whether I should react or not. Um, of course, I agree with all of you that uh, physical uh, uh, teaching is, is the most optimal way also for creating the relatedness and, and the social interaction. Um, I'm definitely also not in favor of online teaching. Um, before, I was uh, also a professor at the uh, Maastricht University, which is a traditional university, uh, which I had my working groups with, with uh, students, with, in which I was giving uh, lectures in big lecture halls. Um, and now, all our teaching is, uh, is online at the Open University. But still, I think there is some connectedness and some relatedness with the students and also among the students. But they found a lot of other ways to get in touch with each other, whereas there are whole cohorts of students who have, have never seen each other in real life. But you know, they set up Facebook groups, uh, they interact uh, through um, yeah, WhatsApp groups, uh, all kinds of different uh, media uh, things. Um, so there are alternatives, and I think some of the students, which I then know as a teacher for a, a bit longer time, because I'm also supervising their master thesis, for example, and I have monthly uh, face, uh, uh, meetings uh, via Teams or Skype, at a certain moment you still get to know each other. And, yeah. <clears throat> This is interesting because now, um, with all these discussions, I was thinking about my personal teaching experience and career. And uh, I started as a language teacher, was working for about 10 years, and then I had a daughter. And then I decided to just have a better work-life balance and work from home. So I was continuing the teaching, but I didn't want to go anywhere. And so I continued like five years before COVID, teaching online. And it was sometimes several students and sometimes one-to-one -one teaching, tutoring. I have to tell you that you know everything about your student. You know how this, because I mean, having a good expertise in teaching your subject. Yes. <laughs> this even, even yeah, yeah. But um, because uh, yeah, one of my students, first of my students, then became my partner. Yes. So you you do you do. <laughs> you do know a lot about a person, and have the you learning. Met him? Have you seen him physically? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, but indeed, you can build those connections, also personal connections. Aside from the whole learning experience, it's just easier one to one for the moment. But I discovered, like uh, we thought. Yesterday, we shared that um, some of us believed some time ago that online shopping for clothes would not work. And like, I was pretty confident about that. But now I buy most of my clothes online somehow, I don't know. But um, this is, I have a similar feeling with the online learning. So, but when I started teaching online one-to-one, -one, you can replicate a lot of this experience in a different way. Is it worse for learning? No. Sometimes it's even better because students focus not on you, but on the content. And if you stimulate them in the right way, yes. It needs a lot of interaction, yes. It needs a lot of talking, yes. But it's not impossible. So far, everything that you know works perfectly as a system, as an ecosystem. What we know about every little tool, I mean, it's imperfect. And it does not totally work as a system. And we know very little about how exactly the system which we have in face-to-face -face world works. So it will take a long time. But maybe um, eventually, we will be able to have very flexible and very engaging and effective learning experiences also online. But not necessarily. So yeah, just wanted to share this. <laughs> Do 
There's one more. There's one more. I want to ask uh, a question for both <laughs> uh, Roy and Enrique. <laughs> because you two are now actually investigating in Cloud Classroom, but you also said that uh, you prefer obviously the physical way. So I was going to ask you where those technologies are going to merge in the class and if we are going to be early on on a hybrid system? Yes, uh, it's a very, a very interesting question because the virtual communication is, uh, is always communication in a distance. And uh, uh, there is another uh, virtual communication, even because if I, if I have in a, in a presential situation an object, a digital object, this is a virtual communication. It's not, uh, and, and you are with me. Uh, I, I think that the, the, key, the, the key challenge is um, or will be uh, will, will be a, a phrase a, a sentence that uh, pronounce uh, Catalina. Um, uh, she said, uh, uh, "Searching the better technology in the in the right hands." This is the, 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 the key challenge. This, this, this is the, 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 the future. It's not a future, uh, not only face-to-face, uh, -face, not only virtual, virtual communication, uh, we, um, but a, 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 a mid, a mid situation, a mid situation that, uh, okay, uh, how is your reality? What is your reality? Your, your reality is, is this group? or your Instagram group. What, 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 yes, it's the same. It's a, it's a continuum. Hmm? It's a continuum, it's a, it's a follow. It, uh, it, uh, the, I, I think that the uh, real, <coughs> uh, the, real um, uh, um, the real point of this uh, kind of, uh, of systems is um, make a, a, a natural communication. Natural communication in all of uh, uh, situations. Hmm? Uh, presential, face-to-face, -face, online, it's the same. All is communication. The best communication, the more ergonomic communication, more interactive, more uh, usable. Um. Yeah, and uh, inside the classroom, in a traditional way, as we teach you, I don't see how mm, Cloud Class will fit uh, inside the classroom. I mean, with inside the classroom, I mean, I, I, I get a plotter, a green screen, and I'm with a green screen, and you're looking at me in a TV. It doesn't make sense at all. Uh, and for w just seeing 3D objects, that I think it will come that. Uh, for example, I teach technology, but instead of a photograph of a microphone, I can show you a 3D model. Okay, I turn like this, and here is the power button, and, and then I have an animation, and you can see, okay, this, you need the models, as you asked before, a uh, guy asked before. Uh, but it will come, but you don't need Cloud Class for that. But we have discussed a lot uh, uh, because the case in a traditional study like this is very different. And we think that immediately now it has a news as the flipped classroom uh, strategy, which is uh, we, I prepare as a teacher some content and then I, I put it on the virtual campus and I tell you, okay, on Wednesday we are going to discuss about this content. Watch the video if you have any doubt or whatever, and then we will have a debate in class. For example, in technology, it's something I, it always happens to me that like it's very difficult because it's uh, to have debates because it's a microphone, it's a dynamic microphone, and there's no debate <laughs> about the microphone or the type or the construction, but maybe in, in a more open, uh, philosophical or whatever uh, subjects, it's really, really interesting that you create uh, a, a basic knowledge before and then the class is not just to tell you that knowledge that is already there, but to discuss and to have a, a debate about uh, the content. So in that scenario, I think it's a very powerful tool. Thanks. Okay, um, time to commercial. Hmm? 
Time for commercial. Okay, uh, I <laughs> I want to talk to you uh, uh, about uh, a, a book. Um, uh, you, you are you are so young, uh, but uh, I I think I am sure that uh, you don't remember Francisco Umbral in a program in a in a famous program of tele, of television. Uh, when, when, when you talk about my book, <laughs> I, I am here to talk my book. Uh, okay, uh, this is the moment. Okay, okay. Uh, this uh, this book is uh, Cloud Class, uh, Comunicación Virtual para la Innovación Docente, and uh, it's, a, um, it's not a book. Hmm? It's uh, it's the history of an er effort. Uh, Yes, an effort uh, for uh, between uh, 20 uh, authors, uh, 10 uh, universities, three companies, um, uh, five nationalities, and uh, a, 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 huge, uh, a huge content, uh, a very dense content. And uh, I, okay, I, 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 uh, I, I think to, to buy, uh, some books for for the uh, our, 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 our uh, library, and uh, but uh, I I want to uh, I want to uh, that 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 you read the, this uh, this book because uh, is uh, the the last of uh, virtual reality uh, for uh, for teaching for teaching innovation. <laughs> And uh, I, I think that uh, the, the best word uh, will be the, the one of uh, his uh, authors, and uh, he's uh, also the, the, the boss of, of this uh, project. And uh, what, what do you feel uh, with this experience, uh, Chicho? About the writing a book? Yes. Well, it was very hard because uh, I'm not belonging to the academic world. I have been teaching some MBA, one, one lesson, but I'm not used to, to write uh, books or articles, publication. I, I, I just, I just uh, write proposals mm -hmm. uh, for being funded as, the, as this project, but uh, it was very challenging. And I had to work with Elena. Elena is more from the university, so I sent all my, my ideas, etc., and she put it in, a, in the right way. So, if there are something in, a, in a, the right format, it's because Elena is not from me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and you, Roy? Well, for, for me, it was also the first time I coordinated a, a book, and uh, even though it was a, a two side work, it, it was very nice because we get people to participate here, as you said, from many institutions and people that is very specialized in this. For example, uh, Antia talked about Sevilla, and uh, there's a group that is a reference uh, uh, worldwide, and of course in Spain, and Julio Cabero, which is the leader, leader, the leader uh, researcher, has uh, taken part in this book. So uh, I think this book uh, deals not only with cloud class, but the whole uh, virtual environment in education and technology and how we bring this and everything we were talking today of how to fill in that gap that is between technology and education and if that's useful or not and tries from many points of view, many different points of view to uh, answer that, that issue. I don't know if we get the answer because probably there's no one answer yet, but... Uh, many. Or there are many, many yeah. Yes. <laughs> but uh, we think we got as near as we could with the people we get involved in it. Okay, uh, for me is uh, the um, the history of an effort, and also uh, uh, is the is the history of uh, no difference. Is uh, there is no uh, professors and students, there is no uh, academic or professionals. There is no one nationality or another. Uh, this is a, a, a world world, uh, a virtual world. And uh, for that, uh, for me, it's a, it's a very, very special uh, book, maybe the more special of my books. And uh, I, I think, uh, I, I, I hope that uh, you like it, okay?
just last last word. Not 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 about the, the book, but about the, the the project. Because if this project is possible, is because uh, the European Commission and the CDIT, the FEDETI, have funded this project. So with the with the with the taxes of all of you. Or, or your parents <laughs> <laughs> and the European, uh, the European citizens, we have uh, money in order or funding in order to explore this new work. And I hope that in uh, five years you will be with your friends saying, I was one of the first watching a presentation about uh, Cloud Class. And Cloud Class would be a good tool, an international tool used in. in in education, so it would be fantastic. This is what we are putting a lot of effort. Time for, for promotional. Hmm? <laughs> the, the, the black man is, is spying. Well, well, you always need to say thank you to who's putting the money, yes, right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> okay, now the, the, you, you, you know, yeah, you know uh, about the, already about the, the Cloud Class book. And now I want to, to uh, uh, that, um, uh, Chicho, uh, can you explain the next steps uh, about the project, the Cloud Class project? Yeah, I'm going to be very, very uh, short because you you have been seated during a long time. So the next step is, you know, uh, uh, all the technology is almost there. There are some bugs, of course, that we are we will be refining during uh, during the validation. But now the next step is to validate uh, this technology uh, in. Uh, USC, uh, they are in a very good position, as you know, Roy and, <laughs> and Rocio, they are professionals and they can guide you in the use of the application. Uh, in the University of, uh, of Netherlands, on the Open University of Netherlands, that uh, they have all the equipment now and they are starting to validate the system. And we are going to get a lot of feedback, not just about how the technology needs to improve from the technical point of view, but also from interaction, uh, etc. So we are going to concentrate on that. Uh, at the end of uh, February next year, uh, the solution should be ready and uh, very well adapted to the needs of the, of the universities. But the most important, we are now focusing a lot on, on teachers, but here you will have the possibility in USC to use it by students. And we are always focusing on, on teachers. And maybe this technology is better for students, because you can boost your creativity, as uh, Itia said. You can, you can start creating new skills, like talking in front of a, a camera, explaining things, etc. And also uh, co collaborating, or co -working, collaborating with a team, one team can select the content, another team can select 3D models, other can prepare the speech, and in groups you can create something really nice that could be produced and included in a repository forever. You can show whenever you want to your, so, to your children in the future, whatever. <laughs> so uh, I think it's a good opportunity for you. So if you, you can, I don't know if it is the group who can, who can join to this, uh, this thing. But uh, it will be nice. Yeah, uh, I would like to thank all the students to come here today, uh, PhD students, but especially those that are in the first year here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what uh, Francisco is, is talking about is uh, a subject I teach in the fourth year. Uh, which is Innovation Lab, where we use this technology to create content, and you will be able to use it there, and if you, it's an optative, you can get it or not. <laughs> I expect you get it if you came here. <laughs> but uh, uh, there we will we'll be working on this, you will learn how to use it and all these kind of things, but if you want to use it previously for any project or whatever, you know me, and now you know Rocio, which is around, maybe she killed me, because <laughs> probably <laughs> she... And, and, and them, yeah. For example, <laughs> if, you, if you want to in Erasmus or, or wherever, uh, it's also the opportunity. So here you met people from different parts that are interested in this. So if it's interesting for you, you don't have to wait for years or three years to get 
to the subject that in the uh, planification of, the, of your degree is in fourth year, but you can come to us previously and say, okay, I would like to try this. Maybe have you some time, one afternoon to show me and uh, I want to create this content to present something that I did to some people or for this subject or whatever. And we are more than welcome to do that because as Chicho said, we are willing to test if it's useful for you also. So we want to know what you think about, just as we ask now, <laughs> okay, this is what do you think, but if you try it, of course, your, your opinion will be much more valuable because you already touched the technology. So, uh, Rocio, that is there, uh, <laughs> will be willing to help you, <laughs> yes. and me, and Enrique, of course, yes. and the uh, OU. And finally, if you need something else that we cannot fix, we have always Chicho and Brainstorm, and we call them, and they are always willing to help us. The last resource. Yeah, they are the last resource because they are in lots of things, and we try not to bother them too much. I, I must say that uh, I don't like the protagonism of Rocio in this impossible. <laughs> it's not cloud class, it's Rocio class. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, any more? No. Okay, um, I, I beg you, I, I beg you a, a favor because I, I want to, to close um, the, this symposium, this very special symposium, with a sentence. Do you, do you remember Matrix? Uh, first, uh, yes, <laughs> Matrix. Uh, first, uh, brother Wachowski, and after sister. Um, I, do you remember? Uh, Welcome to the real world. Yes? Okay. But now, welcome to the virtual world. Thank you.